We are live. Thank you. Sergeants, you may begin your recordings. PC recording has started. Thank you. Cloud recording started. Thank you. Okay, back up. Okay. Uh, Sergeant Polite, you may begin with your opening statement. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the remote hearing on general welfare. Will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may sing your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair 11, we're ready to begin. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this hearing of the City Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, the committee will conduct an oversight hearing on the progress in developing supportive housing units and what strategies, if any, are in place to ensure that those of the highest need have access to supportive housing. The committee will also explore how COVID-19 has impacted the development of supportive housing and how the city plans to address such challenges. Supportive housing is a form of affordable housing that offers residents access to on-site support in order to help low-income people and those experiencing homelessness and or a disability live independently in the community. Services in supportive housing vary depending on the needs of the population, but in many, but many include mental and medical health care, vocational and employment services, child care, independent living skills, training, <clears throat> and substance abuse counseling. We know that supportive housing is the important model we have for ending homelessness among vulnerable populations. In November of 2015, Mayor de Blasio announced that the city would provide $2.6 billion in capital funding to develop 15,000 units of supportive housing over the next 15 years. And as of December of 2019, the city financed the preservation and creation of 6,225 supportive housing units under this plan, including the construction of 4,650 supportive housing units and the preservation of 1,500 and 75 units. These are desperately needed units and unfortunately the need remains significantly higher than what has been produced since the launch of New York 1515. The committee will also hear bills that I have introduced. The first would ensure that police officers are no longer involved in outreach efforts and that these efforts be limited only to DHH staff and contracted outreach workers. Experiencing homelessness on the street and in the subways is not a crime. And I hope that this bill will ensure that there is less harm done by limiting the involvement of police in these interactions. The piece of, le the piece of legislation is, is, uh, is a supportive housing bill. Uh, sorry, another piece of legislation is the supportive housing bill of rights um, to be written by DSS and distributed by supportive housing providers to their tenants upon initial occupancy at each lease renewal and upon request. This bill would help improve transparency by ensuring every tenant in supportive housing has their rights made known to them. I wanna thank the advocates and members of the public for joining us today. I wanna to thank the representatives from the administration who will be joining us as well. And I look forward to hearing from you all on these critical issues. And at this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. Uh, we're joined by Council Member Brad Lander, uh, Council Member Barry Grudenchik, Council Member Bob Holden. Um, and that's it for now. Uh, we expect more uh, throughout the course of the hearing. I also wanna thank uh, staff that have worked on this, uh, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff. Um, oh, Council Member Helen Rosenthal has joined us as well. Um, Elizabeth Adams, my legislative director, committee staff, Aminta Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omari, policy analyst, and Frank Sarno, financial analyst. I'd also have to thank um, uh, our sergeants, uh, as well as Joanna Castro for, um, uh, for organizing this hearing today. Um, and uh, with that, I will turn it over to our committee counsel uh, to administer the um, 
the affirmation. Thank you, Chair, Chair Levin. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel to the General Welfare Committee of the New York City Council. I'm gonna be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I want to remind you that you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. And I'll periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. Our first panel will be members of the administration. Testifying for the administration is Annette Holm and available for questions and answers is Jennifer Kelly, Michael Boskett, Aaron Drinkwater, Emily Lehman, and Gail Walsk. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and Chair Levin will call on you in order. And we are going to be limiting council member questions to five minutes and that includes answers. I'm now going to deliver the oath to the members of the administration who will be testifying, as well as those who are here to respond to questions. And I'll read off each of your names and after that point, you may respond beginning with Annette Holm. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And now moving on to Jennifer Kelly. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And now Michael Boskett, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Aaron Drinkwater, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. To Emily Lehman, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And finally, to Gail Walsk, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. You may begin your testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Chairperson Levin and members of the City Council's General Welfare Committee for the opportunity to testify today about supportive housing a critically necessary resource in the fight against homelessness. I am Annette Holm, Chief Special Services Officer at the New York City Human Resources Administration. Today, I am joined by colleagues from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, Emily Lehman, Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Special Needs Housing, and from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Gail Walsk, Senior Director, Office of Housing Services, as well as my Human Resources Administration colleagues, Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Supportive Affordable Housing and Services, Jennifer Kelly, Deputy Commissioner of Customized Assistance Services, Michael Boskett, and Erin Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner of Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs. It has been 40 years since the first supportive housing project residence in New York City opened its doors. While much has changed since that time, we continue to rely on the benefit from this proven evidence-based resource, which combines permanent affordable housing with supportive social services. So individuals and families are able to achieve their maximum level of independence and health in a safe, supportive environment. Supportive housing projects provide high quality independent living environments for vulnerable New Yorkers who might otherwise find themselves in more restrictive and more expensive institutional settings, such as psychiatric hospitals, emergency rooms, jails, and shelter. This permanent housing model includes voluntary services that are focused on positively impacting tenants' quality of life, assisting in their personal path of addressing mental health challenges and or substance use. Services are customized to meet the unique needs of each resident and can include mental health and substance use services, employment services and resources, and education service and resources. 
For families with children, the program provides the supports needed to maintain a safe home environment conducive to healthy development of their children. In 1990, the New York, New York One Agreement between the Dinkins and Cuomo administrations created 3,615 units of supportive housing. This first of its kind agreement licensed permanent and transitional housing for individuals experiencing homelessness who have been diagnosed with mental illness in New York City. New York, New York One population groups targeted single New Yorkers experiencing homelessness with a serious mental illness or individuals with serious mental illness with a co-occurring substance use disorder. The second New York, New York II in 1999 under the Giuliani and Pataki administrations created an additional 1,500 units of supportive housing for individuals experiencing homelessness who have been diagnosed with mental illness. This agreement resulted in 45.7 million and 85 million in state and city capital funding for supportive housing respectively. Finally, the New York, New York Three Agreement in 2005 between the Bloomberg and Pataki administrations committed to create 9,000 units of supportive housing in New York City over 10 years. As of September 2020, of the 9,000 planned units for New York, New York Three, 8,900 have been awarded. Of those 8,900 awarded units, 8,487 are fully developed for occupancy. Of those 8,487 ready units, the overall state city occupancy rate is 90%, with a total of 7,593 New Yorkers moving into New York, New York three units between January 2014 and September 2020 and the remainder having moved in prior to 2014. The occupancy rate for the city contracted New York, New York three units is 95% as it has been for many years. These 14,115 units were not enough to meet the need of vulnerable New Yorkers. And in November of 2015, Mayor de Blasio announced New York City 1515, which is the largest municipal commitment to supportive housing. New, New York City 1515 will result in the development of 15,000 units of supportive housing over 15 years and is modeled on the New York, New York agreements. Over 15 years, the city over, excuse me, over 15 years, the city will create 7,500 newly built congregate units and obtain an additional 7,500 scattered site units. These residential units are equipped with on-site case management and supportive services and adhere to safety and quality standards in accordance with local, state, and federal laws and regulations. Funding for 5,306 New York City 1515 units has been awarded, which is more than a third of the 15 year total. Through September 2020, more than 2,300 people have already moved into nearly 1,800 New York City 1515 units, and another 109 were linked to homes and in the process of moving in. In support of housing, a family or individual pays 30% of their income towards rent. Participation in services is not required to maintain their tenancy, but many tenants do in fact take advantage of the comprehensive services, including case management, educational, vocational, and other recover recovery oriented services, individualized service planning and supportive counseling, assistance in navigating and gaining access to community services and government benefits such as food stamps and legal advocacy, referrals to medical and behavioral health care 
and treatment and recommendations and support in developing skills for financial self-sufficiency. This stable and permanent housing for New Yorkers with mental illness and substance use challenges who have experienced homelessness, as well as other vulnerable populations, such as New Yorkers with HIV, provides an environment of support and increases connections to services, increasing positive outcomes for those living in supportive housing. Supportive housing reduces the city's reliance on homeless shelters, hospitals, mental health institutions, and incarceration, setting up these individuals and families for success and in the long term saves the taxpayer higher costs. The Department of Housing Preservation and Development, DHS, and HRA communicate daily to coordinate our response to the homelessness crisis. One of the major avenues is through our efforts to refer and place homeless households out of shelters and into permanent housing. For supportive housing projects, HPD, DOHMH, and HRA conduct regular meetings so that HRA knows when specific HPD buildings will be completing construction and when apartments will become available. HRA also attends marketing and lease up kickoff meetings with HPD and the project development teams so that they are aware of construction and market marketing timelines. When an apartment is available, HRA refers three eligible shelter clients to the apartment and the service provider makes their decision. Communication between our agencies occurs at several at several points during the referral and placement process. Our agencies will continue to seek ways to streamline the supportive and homeless housing referral process, such as partnering on the design and implementation of the coordinated assessment and placement system and ensuring that the shelter system's most vulnerable clients receive housing and the rental assistance they need. It is essential that we continue the progress we have made to create even more supportive housing, and the Council has been a critical partner in helping us build more of it. The administration is extremely grateful to the council members here today for helping us educate New Yorkers about the benefits of supportive housing and for welcoming a number of wonderful supportive housing developments throughout the neighborhoods you represent. Together, since the start of Housing New York, we have financed more than 6,250 supportive housing homes, with many more being closed on this month in New York City 1515 and other programs. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has been contracting and providing program monitoring and technical assistance to supportive housing providers since the initial development of programs in the mid 1980s. Currently, DOHMH plays a lead role in contracting, monitoring, and evaluation of services for individuals in 9,718 units of the city's supportive housing units. These units are in 170 congregate site buildings and 80 scatter site programs. These units were developed under the following program initiatives, New York, New York 1, 2, and 3, High Service Needs 1 and 2, Justice Informed Supportive Housing, JISH, and New York 1515. Additionally, HRA oversees services to 1,000 units for individuals with HIV, while services in 4,150 units are supported by state agencies. In addition to working with HRA and HPD to develop units in the New York City 1515 initiative, DOHMH is currently monitoring provision of services in this program to more than 2,300 people who have already moved into 1515 supportive housing 
through 12 contracts providing congregate housing and an additional 26 contracts of scattered site housing. Moreover, HRA works to refer clients to these units while confirming that the recommendations from the 2016 Mayor's Task Force on Supportive Housing are fulfilled. As mentioned, DOHMH will continue to provide programs the technical and contract management support necessary to ensure services meet the needs of tenants, are evidence-based and focus on the recovery of individuals and families. Service evaluation plays a critical part in the city's supportive, supporting housing program and DOHMH coordinates with partners at the city and state level to measure a wide range of quantitative and qualitative data on the programs above. With DOHMH's support, we are able to gather and understand the health, social, and fiscal impacts of these supportive housing programs via feedback collected from tenants and providers. Based on this information, which is highlighted by the New York, New York 3 Interim Evaluation Report, we have seen net savings at above 10,000 annually for single adults housed in supportive housing. The Human Resources Administration Office of Supportive and Affordable Housing and Services is focused on permanent housing solutions for individuals and families who have experienced homelessness. OSIS works closely with other divisions of HRA, our sister agencies, particularly DOHMH and HPD, as well as service providers to establish new housing programs and to serve as the centralized source for the referral of applicants to supportive housing. OSIS coordination and collaboration with our sister agencies and nonprofit partners are geared to ensure that the people we serve are able to achieve their maximum functional capacity in a safe, supportive environment. In early 2016, a supportive housing task force including city agencies, supportive housing providers, and advocates was convened and in December of that year issued a report which included 23 recommendations for New York City 1515 to expand and improve upon the previous New York, New York agreements. The, re the recommendations were grouped into four categories, data and evaluation, referral process, service models, and streamlining development. Today, we are well underway in the implementation of those recommendations. More than 90% of the recommendations are either completed or ongoing, and the remaining recommendations are in the process of being implemented. I want to highlight a few important reforms today, including updates to the New York City Coordinated Assessment and Placement System, CAPS, and the Standardized Vulnerability Assessment, SVA, and COVID-19 related reforms. On October 26, 2020, pursuant to the federal Department of Housing and Urban Development required requirements, HRA implemented a co coordinated assessment and placement system. CAPS is the comprehensive redesign of the Placement Assessment and Client Tracking PAT system to better incorporate the HUD requirements for coordinated entry in New York City and now integrates all application, eligibility determination, referral and placement activities into one system. The CAP system also interfaces with DHS, HASA, DYCD, and Medicaid systems for data. Additional interfaces with DOC and other entities is planned throughout 2021. These interfaces provide demographic, 
homeless status and other data to support and facilitate application and eligibility determination completion. We anticipate this will increase efficiencies in placing individuals and families experiencing homelessness as they transition to permanent housing. Other enhancements include an easy to complete coordinated assessment survey for users and clients of the types of housing and housing subsidies and supports clients may be eligible for retrieval of prior applications and copies of documents HRA is in receipt of that are required for placement. Pre-populating application fields from system integrations with DHS, HASA, DYCD, and HRA systems. Electronic 2010E supportive and general population housing applications. A standardized vulnerability index that assists DHS HRA to focus on those clients with the highest vulnerability and likelihood for continued homelessness a vacancy control system, which upon release had over 30,000 units of supportive and other housing units captured with, within it and allows HRA DHS the ability to monitor vacancies and increase the speed at which we are able to make placements. Electronic referrals, appointments, and documentation transmission for clients to be referred to for interviews with housing providers. The ability for housing providers to act on referrals in the system and relay the outcome of the client interview and acceptance of placement. In addition to coordinating the New York City 1515 supportive housing efforts, HRA is working with our New York State partners to make referrals of households experiencing homelessness into units that New York State has developed as part of their Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative, ESHI. Our collaborative work includes developing requirements and assessing eligibility for some distinct state ESHI categories and working with our DHS shelter providers and street homeless pro programs to refer eligible candidates to these units. Working with our state partners and their nonprofit providers has expanded supportive housing opportunities for DHS clients in, in many areas. For example, frail and elderly populations, individuals with mental health diagnosis, and survivors of domestic violence. This is a meaningful component to the existing supportive housing portfolio. We recently partnered with the New York State Office of Mental Health on an initiative to house clients experiencing street homelessness. New York State identified more than 200 units in their ESHI portfolio is specifically for this population. To date, we have linked almost 90% of the units to clients experiencing street homelessness and in need of permanent supportive housing. And the remaining clients are waiting for the state's providers to locate scattered site units. Last year, HRA, DHS, HPD, and DOHMH worked in collaboration with community stakeholders to create several key recommendations to increase access to supportive housing. Recommendations include streamlining the housing application process, expanding the pool of professionals who can submit psychiatric evaluations, and expediting the housing application process. The goals of these recommendations are to reduce client barriers and enhance the client experience throughout the application, interview, and move-in process for supportive housing. Finally, in our continued effort to better serve New Yorkers in need of supportive housing, we are assessing and updating the online supportive housing application completed by a referral agency known as the 2010E application. For example, 
we are ensuring that questions regarding preferred spoken language and ethnicity include the top 30 languages in New York City and a comprehensive, comprehensive listing of ethnicity choices, respectively. We are also ensuring, ensuring that more responses such as non-binary and gender, gender non-conforming are included under gender identity so that clients can properly express how they identify. Developed through the work of the Supportive Housing Task Force during 2016, the New York City Standardized Vulnerability Assessment is conducted on all approved HRA supportive housing application referrals. This assessment takes into consideration the applicant's living situation, current and history, Medicaid utilization, challenges impacting their independence and functional limitations. And from those metrics determines the level of continued vulnerability of homelessness. The SVA uses a categorical system of high, medium, and low vulnerability. HRA continues to work with our government, community, provider, and advocacy group partners, and from these collaborative efforts in 2019, further refine the SVA better to assess uniquely vulnerable groups, including unsheltered individuals, survivors of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, families with children, and young adults. COVID-19 required us as an agency to take a look at our processes so that we could continue to serve clients in a means that prioritize their health and safety as well as that of our staff. As such, in the early state of the pandemic, we set up processes with housing providers and DHS staff to conduct clinical interviews remotely. We also set up a system and process for property management interviews to be conducted virtually when, wherever possible. Our partners at HPD also transformed their manual process to include e-signatures on documents in lieu of original signatures, as well as remote briefings. We see a great benefit to our clients in conducting interviews in this manner, including no-shows to interviews. We have worked with our partners at DOHMH to support increased capacity for congregate programs to isolate tenants on site or to utilize the city's hoteling program. DOHMH has supported provider use of virtual services to ensure service provision that supports the health and wellness of all tenants and staff. This includes virtual meetings, increasing access to Wi-Fi for tenants, and support with PPE supplies for providers. Additionally, there are added efficiencies for DHS-funded programs and supportive housing providers alike. We intend to continue these changes post COVID when we are no longer required to social distance and limit in-person interactions. Overall, there have been 11,883 supportive housing placements from DHS shelter from the beginning of this administration in January 2014 through September 2020. Included in these numbers are recent supportive housing placements from DHS shelters across various programs. In the calendar year 20 through September 2020, DHS, DH, DSS, DHS, HRA placed 1,035 households into permanent supportive housing from DHS shelters. This includes ongoing placements into the various congregate and scatter site supportive housing programs, including New York, New York 1 through 3, general population supportive housing, New York state license programs, and ESHI, and placements into new New York City 1515 programs. Progress on this administration's ambitious New York City 1515 plan is also on target. 
construction awards through September 2020 are as follows. We have awarded 5,306 1515 units to providers, including 1,255 scattered site and 4,051 congregate units. Across all city agencies through September 2020, nearly 1,800 households comprised of more than 2,300 New Yorkers have been connected to 1515 supportive housing units, including more than 1,700 households comprised of more than 2,200 people who already moved into homes and another 109 households who were linked to homes and in the process of moving as of September 28th, 2020. As of September 2020, HRA's HASA program has a contracted supportive housing portfolio of 5,362 units, of which 4,924 units are already occupied. HASA spends up about $141.5 million annually for these units. 2,672 scattered site units, including New York, New York 3 and non-New York, New York 3, of which 93.4%, 2,496 individuals are occupied. Um, excuse me, 2,496 units are occupied. And the remaining units are in the process of development or rent up. 2,690 permanent congregate units, including New York, New York 3 and non-New York, New York 3, of which 90%, 2,428 units are occupied. I would now like to turn to the legislation being heard as part of today's hearing. Intro number 2177, sponsored by Chair Levin, would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to outreach to unsheltered individuals. This bill, if enacted, would limit outreach to unsheltered individuals to Department of Homeless Service staff or staff contracted by the department to contact and offer services to unsheltered individuals experiencing homelessness. The administration is reviewing the impact of this legislation that has just been introduced. Upon initial review and preliminary discussions with providers and sister agencies, we have some concerns. Based on these conversations, we believe as drafted, this bill impacts the work of agencies other than DHS, including the FDNY, EMS, DOHMH, and the Parks Department. While our teams of experienced outreach providers are generally able to build relationships with street homeless individuals, that is not always the case. For example, where a client has previously been violent or credibly threatened violence against outreach workers, but needs to be checked on for his or her own safety. Our outreach workers are trained to de-escalate dangerous situations and work with individuals who have a history of violence. However, when the most rigorous training will not always enable an outreach worker to safely interact with a client. Our work includes balancing the interests of our staff, our clients, and the general public. We have strong concerns that the bill will impede us from achieving that responsibility and servicing some of our most in need individuals. We look forward to further discussions with the chair and the council. Intro 2176, also sponsored by Chair Levin, would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the Department of Social Services to create a written notice for supportive housing residents of their rights pursuant to various state and local laws, as well as certain information about the building regulatory scheme. 
the bill would require every provider of supportive housing to provide every resident this notice at the time of initial occupancy at each lease renewal and upon request. Additionally, the bill would subject any provider who violates the notice requirement to a civil penalty of $250. The administration is reviewing the impact of this legislation that has just been introduced, and we look forward to further discussions with the chair and the council. Upon initial review, it appears this bill would set a different standard for city contracted projects compared to those administered by the state. While we are supportive of the general intent of the bill to increase transparency and provide tenants with useful information, we hope to work with the sponsor and stakeholders to address concerns. Supportive housing is a proven resource for individuals and families experiencing homelessness. Voluntary services coupled with quality permanent housing results in positive impacts for tenants' quality of life. This housing first model benefits individuals and families as well as neighborhoods and communities at large. The biggest failure of supportive housing is that there is simply not enough of it to address the need. This is why this administration made the single largest municipal commitment to develop 15,000 units over 15 years and continue to work with our state partners to ensure an equal commitment. We look forward with your, we look forward with our continued work with the council to ensure that each community is playing, playing their part to welcome this permanent affordable housing model to their neighborhoods. And additionally, we look forward to our work together to ensure the state renews its commitment and funds the ESHI program in the fiscal year 22 budget. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify and we welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Holm. Um, I appreciate your testimony. Excuse me, I appreciate all the work that you and your staff do day in and day out because I know that this is um, uh, not easy work um, and, uh, and requires a significant amount of attention uh, to detail um, and uh, uh, stick to itiveness, to borrow a phrase from Councilmember Um because these because because cases are uh, to see them through from one um, from the beginning to end is uh, takes a takes a long time. Um, I want to acknowledge we've also been joined by uh, Councilmember Gibson, Councilmember Salamanca, um, Councilmember Diaz. Um, and I believe that's all of the council members who have joined. Um, so I want to first uh, ask some kind of a, a, a general question, um, if I may. Um, with, if, can you take us through um, the, the process for somebody who is on the street um, and um, has a history of um, mental health diagnoses and uh, uh, is um, continuing to face uh, these challenges, what would be uh, a process for that person, a single adult, um, from um, being on the street, receiving no services, to being um, uh, in a uh, in, in the support of housing development and receiving the services that they need. So what would be that process from end to end? Can you explain that? So I will answer the first part of the question. And when we get to the housing piece, I will defer to my colleague, Jennifer Kelly, who will be able to respond about the actual process of the housing. We have the Department of Homeless Services has an excellent outreach program where they reach out to street homeless and they work with individuals that are um, street homeless to get them assessed for supportive housing. They will work um, with the client and attempt to have them evaluated. And once they are evaluated at that particular point, 
they can be referred to a supportive housing development. So I will um, hand off to Jennifer Kelly who could go more into that process. Hello? Can you Hi. Hear me? Hi, okay, yes. great. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. So as Annette says, the first part of the process is really engaging with the street homeless person and getting the application or the 2010E completed. Once that's done, the application comes into a queue where, where my staff can see it, right? And we can make referrals to different supportive housing units based on the client's level of need and, and the um, services that the supportive housing project provides, right? So a lot of this is really just about trying to make a good match. So what we do- Can I, is can, can I just interject really quickly before we even get to that point? Um, uh, when is the 2010E um, administered or that, when is that um, given? It, it's done at different times, I think, for different individuals, depending on how much stability they need, right? So some are done, I think, from the outreach team, literally while the person is on the street, whereas other folks may need to be brought into a safe haven and stabilized there, in which case they would follow that process at that point. But it, there's, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. At what point are they enter at what point are there is there does somebody have a caps um, entry or does somebody have a caps case? Um, I think when you're when now because now we have the cap system live, right? So when you are actually doing the application, you are entering the cap system at this point, right? So so you would do the assessment survey, figure out what what the best housing options are for the individual, and then assuming, presuming it's supportive housing in this case, that would lead you right into the supportive housing application. So mm -hmm. I, I, I hope I'm answering your question, but I think at that point they have entered officially the CAP system. Okay. Um, okay, you can keep going. I'm, I'm, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, so, so once the application is in the system, as I said, my team can see it and we'll make referrals. We will send three people usually for every opportunity. We, we try to send, especially we're very sensitive uh, to this on street homeless individuals. We try to send three similarly situated individuals for each vacancy. Um, and then one individual is selected. If we're renting up a building, so if there are a lot of vacancies, we would send larger numbers of people in mass. And, and then it's, um, you know, they will just select the people that they feel are a good match for their program. So, um... And, um, and either uh, Officer Holm or Deputy Commissioner Kelly, you can answer this. That, so how do we track how often people are going from the street directly into supportive housing without, without being in a shelter first? Or does that happen at all? Or is, that, or is there always an entry into shelter of some I mean, I'll answer from my perspective and then Annette, if you wanna add, I mean, we do not track it. I think DHS may have statistics on that. We don't have those statistics, statistics today, but I don't believe there ever has to be an entry into shelter in order to do an application. As I said, some safe havens are not technically considered shelters. <clears throat> Many people go into those and then are placed from there, but there are also other options where people are placed directly from the street. Okay, for the, for the purposes of this conversation, let's consider safe havens to be a form of shelter. They're within the DHS system. So it, it just, I'm, I'm curious how many people are going directly from the street into a safe haven or if that happens at all. We would have to provide you with those numbers. We don't have that right now available, but there are cases where someone can be housed from the street into a unit, but we would have to provide you with those numbers. Because um, we do hear that people from the street have the hardest time getting into supportive housing. So um, that's the concern is that um, uh, they're often de denied. Um, Commissioner Kelly, you said that uh, if, if for a unit, you'll, you'll, uh, the, the administration or the, the system, I don't know, the CAP system will, will, um, will generate three names um that are in similar situ in have similar circumstances is that right 
I mean, we have we have more discretion than that, really. It doesn't just generate the names. So, you know, I mean, there are, each unit is very, um, very specific just in terms of, of the services that are provided, but also the rental subsidies. So there are a lot of factors to, um, to consider with, with each unit, but also client preference is a factor that needs to be you know, considered, borough preference, things of that nature, you know, if the unit's accessible for people with ambulatory issues, all of these things. So, you know, so we do have to take that into consideration, but yes, the, the system assists us in making matches and, and that's, that's one of the benefits of it. Um, <clears throat> how does the system track um, refusals or denials? So if um, somebody has, if somebody wants to know how many times, say they're in safe haven, they've been in safe haven, this is the hypothetical, been safe haven for uh, 250 days, um, how, how would they be able to know how many times they've been, their name has been submitted for a supportive housing unit and how many times they've been denied and for what reasons they've been denied? I think at this point, I'd actually like to turn this over to my colleague, Michael Boskett, who um, oversees the, the CAPS implementation. And I think he can talk mm -hmm. a little bit better about the data system. Okay. So thank you, Council Member Levin. Um, what I, the system as um, Ms. Holm spoke about earlier was implemented on October 26th. So just a little bit under two months ago. Um, and as it's a new system, I think that what we have to say is that we're continuing to refine how we collect data. And this kind of data collected in an electronic system is new for HRA. Um, while we intend to collect that level of data, it would be hard to report that out at this time, but it, we are hoping to produce that level of detailed data sometime in 2021. Okay. I mean, that's obviously a, 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 something that I think we would like to know kind of in, um, as a bigger picture, um, you know, what, what percentage, what reasons are being, uh, people are being denied, what percentage they're being denied are being denied and then and then i think <clears throat> certainly more more granularly i think if i was a if i was a a person who had filled out a 2010 e and was awaiting a supportive housing unit and you know was was in a shelter for a year i would want to know why i'd want to know what you know what's what how many times and, and, and for what reasons I, I would be denied is there is there an expiration date on a 2010 E? You saw a 2010 E, it's, it's deemed valid. Is that for a certain period of time? Uh, yes, uh, a 2010 E is valid for 18 months. So from the date of its acceptance or its approval to the date the determination is is um, valid for eight, an 18 month period. Okay, and then what happens at the end of that 18 months if they're not placed? At the end of the 18 months, if they're not placed, um, a housing referral, can, a new 2010E can be produced um, through the system. So they could would have to go back into the CAP system, fill out a new 2010E, because in an 18-month period, there could be considerable change in many of these clients' lives, um, including um, new conditions or worsening conditions that would really need to be considered for a new determination. Um, so I'm gonna give you a like semi-hypothetical situation. Um, so, uh, uh, client goes into shelter from the street, um, uh, refuses to fill out a 2010 E, um, exhibits some mental health, um, outward manifestations of mental health diagnoses, um, and you know, just refuses to fill out a 2010 E for long period of time. Um, the shelter staff um, sees no uh, way to get that to move forward. Sees, you know, has not been able to make, to establish trust or establish a working relationship with this client. Um, uh, they remain in shelter. What, what is the, what's, it's, it's clear, I think, 
to everybody involved that that person could uh, be in the in the supportive housing environment. What what does what what resources are available? What what how does how does the system address a case like that? So in the part of DHS, I would say that they work with community partners. If that individual is known to any other entity, they would reach out to that entity to try to assist in having a 2010 E completed. There are often clients who may not feel comfortable sharing their information with DHS, but they be, may be known to an advocacy group or a community group that may be working with them. And if that is in fact the case, and we do know that information, we can um, you leverage that to get the 2010 E completed. In addition to that, we can also provide them with a list of community agencies that also complete the 2010 E. So that individual may be more comfortable going someplace else to have the 2010 E completed as opposed to the shelter. But and if I may add to that answer, um, Council Member Levin, uh, at the end of the day, it's all a cons legal consensual process and the, a client has to consent to share health protected information with HRA to make these determinations. So if the client refuses to and community-based organizations are not able to help convince the client to participate in the 2010 E process, we cannot take a 2010 E for a client without a consent that's been signed for the client with the client indicating it's okay to share their health related information with us. Does HRA have um, social workers who are specifically accredited um, to work as part of an outreach um, at program or apparatus to that are social workers, for example, MSWs, or um, that can that that are specifically um, um, you know uh, educated and trained to do this. To do that outreach, in other words, not not just a la not just saying an outreach worker um, that is contracted with one of the outreach uh, organizations, not for profits, but or or an outreach or a case manager at a shelter, but um, but specifically, you know, higher level social workers and the, and the like. At this particular time, HRA does not have social workers who um, are assigned to work with DHS clients to commit to um, perform 2010Es. However, as you pointed out, um, the contracted providers do have social workers and that is part of their task to assist the ones that do have social workers to assist in completion of the 2010E. Um, are you, does DHS or HRA or DSS track um, or have any way of engaging with providers to know um, how or when or if um, they are they're uh, quickly uh, having <clears throat> uh, 2010 e applications completed? Um, for example, if a you know a shelter has um, uh, 150 clients, um, how does how's how's DHS or DSS tracking whether they've completed 2010Es for all of their eligible clients, or how, who's determining also what's the criteria to determine whether or not a 2010E is warranted? Are these questions related to, from what I'm understanding, just to make sure I'm clear, that they're related to the DHS process and how they determine if an individual should complete a 2010 and how is that tracked? So we would have mm -hmm. to reach out to our sister agency, <laughs> DHS, to um, respond to those questions. But almost everybody that's filling out a 2010 e is coming from a DHS, from the DHS system in some way, right? Correct, but I believe that your answer was a little bit more than just where is it coming from, just to determine, you know, how many applications are being submitted by each provider and what is the criteria, what are they doing in terms of um, 
ensuring that a 2010 E um, has been completed. I can say, and Michael Bosket can speak further to this, that um, HRA CAS has trained DHS providers in regards to the 2010 E process and what is required. Okay, the reason that I ask is just, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I, if I may um, address the sure. latter part of your question where you asked how somebody may know if they're eligible um, for supportive housing or not. P part of the coordinated assessment survey, that's the beginning of the process and it's, it's uh, about 20 questions, doesn't take a long time to complete, maybe 30 minutes. Based on the way that that, it's, that survey is completed, it would indicate whether or not the client might be eligible for supportive housing. And, and then if it, and then so it would, um, if, if the answers to those questions um, uh, indicate that, that uh, supportive housing might be an option for that client, then there's a, a prompt to fill out a 2010 e but because the reason I ask is that, so I've had constituents over the years um, that have come to me either in my office, either they've been in shelter or they're on the street. Um, and, you know, at some point, the conversation, we say, okay, have you filled out a 2010 E? And, you know, there have been many times where they've, the answer has been a what, you know, or no, I haven't filled that out. Um, or, you know, we'll ask, are you, if you, are you looking to get into supportive housing? Yes, I am. It's permanent housing. Great. Are you filled out a 2010 E? No. You know, and and so we just don't. We're, it's it's a it's unclear to us. Um, and and certainly I could you know I'm speaking on behalf of my staff who who works with constituents all the time. Um, uh, where you know we we end up kind of taking them through that process. Um, and so. It, it, it's, I mean, maybe is this before, I don't know how it was done before CAPS, maybe CAPS is, has a, or the coordinated assessment has a, has a, um, uh, you know, at the initial assessment has, has, has a, that new system is, is, is doing a better job of it. I just don't know whether that's the case. Well, one thing I could respond to your question with is upon completion of the survey, um, the Results also would show five year prior history of 2010 applications. So you could go in and complete an application on Mike Bosket, a, a survey on Mike Bosket. And upon completion of that survey, it would show you the past five year history of 2010s, as well as give you, um, as um, Chief Special Officer Home indicated in her testimony, as well as give you a number of other documents that are needed and required for permanent placement and supportive housing if the client is selected for, for um, supportive housing. Okay, and that was, and that's under the new system, not the old system. That's correct. Okay. Just to reiterate what um, Deputy Commissioner Boskett stated, that this new CAPS that we have has really made it um, easier for anyone who's assessing an individual to make that determination as to whether that person should complete a 2010E if they are um, appropriate to complete a 2010E by, a by answering the questions in advance. So it doesn't have to be selective like, well, you know, this person said yes and another person said no. It's really based on how you answer the questions determines whether a 2010E should be completed. So that's the, that's the good thing with this new process that we have. And if I may, if supportive housing is indicated as a possible housing exit, um, it automatically uh, will direct you to complete the 2010E. And right now with the interfaces and some of the questions that are asked as part of the survey, the interfaces that um, Ms. Holm described during her testimony, approximately 25% of the 2010 e application is autofilled, which therefore um, decreases the amount of time the whoever mm -hmm. is completing the 2010 e has to take to complete that application. Would would uh, DHS or HRA, and I, I, I'm limited, sorry, would DSS in general um, <laughs> support um, uh, contracting um, uh, not-for-profits 
to be able to do outreach to fill out um, 2010 E applications for people uh, on the street. Um, so in addition to the outreach staff at Breaking Ground and BRC and, and CUCS, is there, um, is there, is, is, is that as something that, that has been entertained or looked into or whether that could be, people could be trained to do that, not for profits that are, you know, appropriate and trained to do so? That is something that we could discuss further within the agency. Um, okay. We could take it up for discussion. Okay. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess my last question before turning it over to my colleagues, um, do, do we know how many um, uh, 2010 E applications have been filled out that are still awaiting a uh, supportive housing placement? Or how many, how many uh, of those, of those active ones that, eight, you know, within the 18 months, how many? Okay, Michael Boskett could respond to that question. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I, I assume what you're asking for is the applications who've been approved but not yet placed. We call that a waiting Correct. placement. Um, yep. At any one time, there are, are usually somewhere in the area of 5,000 people awaiting placement. And how many have been placed since NY 1515? I'd have to ask my colleague, Ms. Kelly, to answer that question. Thank you. So as part of um, 1515, can you all hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so as part of 1515, just in the 1515 initiative, we've placed almost 1,800 households. Yeah. Um, so, and that, I, that equates to over 2,300 people because some of these households are families with children mm -hmm. or adult families. Um, but we also place into, and those are just new units, right? But we also place into re-rentals, which are part of the New York, New York one and two and three agreements. We have still some of the New York, New York three units coming online as well as the Eshi units. So from around 2017 till now, we've placed about 3,500 people just in new units alone, not including the, um, the re-rentals. As um, Ms. Holmes said, since 2014, there have been almost 12,000 people placed in supportive housing um, overall, which would be across. Okay, including the re-rentals. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll be following up with more questions um, after my colleagues, but I will turn it over to my colleagues right now. And I think the first uh, member to have their hand up was uh, Council Member Diaz. Good afternoon. I'm, for full disclosure, I'm now. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. For DHS, a full disclosure, I have spent the last 13 years working within the family shelter system. And until December 1st, I was still working for DHS. And one of my biggest, most difficult tasks was the 2010 application when you went from, when you transferred over to CAPS. And I shared it to say, I want to encourage you to please go back and offer more webinars and more training because as COVID has come upon us, getting on the site and off the site was definitely a challenge. Mike, I, I have one sp specific question in reference to the mental health assessment. For myself, getting the mental health assessment for a client that I would have I've identi I've identified, it took me at least a month. I like to know what's the difference between someone in shelter and me working with outside providers and your resources that you identified with the street homeless, which I would find much more difficult to work with. I would defer to Michael Boskett um, to respond to that question. So uh, there were a couple of questions in there. I think the first related mostly to training or retraining around the new system because we did a lot of it was implemented in COVID. Um, we do offer, offer, offer trainings quite frequently, sorry. Um, 
and uh, we can get to you a schedule of when trainings or retrainings are held. There's also quite a bit of uh, information right on the CAPS system that you can review, and to, including guides and, and um, other items like that. Uh, the second part of your question, Council Member Diaz, if I remember, was around the mental health um, screening. No, uh, not the screening, not the screening, the assessment. Oh, the assessment, I'm sorry. Um, yes, um, uh, during um, uh, uh, Chief of Special Services Holmes testimony, she discussed one of the enhancements we've recently made to the 2010E in an effort to, um, and recognizing the difficulty of getting the mental health assessment was to um, uh, expand the level of professionals or the type of professionals who can include, who can complete those assessments which now includes licensed social workers, as well as licensed mental health counselors. Um, and I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Uh, if you are not aware of it, that is one effort that we've taken, uh, understanding particularly with the street homeless, that could be very difficult to get the types of professionals we had limited to prior. And our hope is by the expansion of these new mental health professionals, it will make it easier to get mental health um, assessments. Okay, and then for my colleagues that have not gone through the process, at least with the, with the families, when you go into, into DHS or into PATH, at the point of intake, families are assessed for alcohol abuse or any illness that they may have. So when we get the clients or when we've gotten a client at the shelter and carefully reading the notes, there will be indicators there as what services the client may need, whether it just be general um, housing connect or we should reach out to, to other services. I'm not sure if you knew that, but there are systems in place um, to help guide non-social workers or professionally trained individuals um, in the mental health services area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh. Um, sorry. Um, Councilor Diaz, if, if uh, you have any further questions, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna do a clock on the, on the question. So feel free to ask any more, they do it. I don't know if you're muted. Um, but until until we hear back from from Dharma, I'll turn it over to uh, Councilor Holden. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I, oh, I'm sorry. sorry I'm, I'm having tech issues. As you know, no I problem. came in ten days ago, and um, doing the best I can to to get it going. So definitely, I would definitely have more questions for for DHS but I would like the opportunity to get, just get back to them at a later time, okay? Sure. Like I said, being part of the system for 13 years, I do walk away with some takeaways that I like to see change and areas of improvement, but being I have this opportunity, I think it would be disingenuous if I did not share that only that someone that was on the boots on the ground and at work for all but nine days, working with DHS staff being at home made my job extremely difficult low responses caused for me to lose units for la with landlords that were definitely willing to work with my clients from transitioning from shelter into, into permanency. So please, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm gonna continue to make that plug for staff that at home to please be mindful to the emails, to the calls that are coming in because it's hard for us boots on the ground to continue to do the work that we're supposed to do if our cohorts are not on board with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Right, Council Member Holden. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Administration, for the testimony. Um, and Bob, just interrupt. Uh, no time limit for for Council Member questions. Oh, thank you. All right. Never heard that before. <laughs> thank you. It's only, it's only us here. So. All right. Um, just. Um, you know, I want to go back to uh, Chair Levin's uh, question about um, when a street homeless, uh, is there, you know, how many go directly into supportive housing? Because that, is, that seems the major obstacle, the shelter uh, system. Many of the street homeless do not want to go into the shelter uh, system for, for various reasons, obviously. May, maybe some had a bad experience, so they'd rather be on the street. So 
Is there a, any special consideration for supportive housing for somebody on the street and how long have they, you know, they've been on the street, the, the months, the, the winter months, especially their condition? What, what, what is the priority here? Did they get any special um, consideration? The so thank you. thank you for that question. As I stated in the testimony earlier, we do have 200 units that the state provided that we um, have targeted for street homeless. In addition to that, DHS has a robust street outreach team that works with street homeless. And we do understand that some individuals prefer not to enter shelter and they will work with them and help them to complete the 2010 E and when possible, move them into a unit if you know all of the criteria is met in terms of completing the application and the process involved from getting from street to unit. Right, but um, and and I'd like to know the number actually that and you know so I know you don't have the number now. How many skip the shelter and go directly from street to supportive housing? Um, that's a very very important. You know, if it's just 15, uh, we need to know if that process is being followed through and if we are accommodating, especially the people on the street and especially their condition. So you said there's 200 units set aside um, and, and I, maybe I missed the answer, but how many are, how, how much vacancy do we have on those 200? Jennifer Kelly can respond to that question. Jennifer, do you have it? Um, if I can, I actually jump in really quickly. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself for a minute, um, and then maybe uh, Jennifer can jump in on the the uh, vacancy piece. Uh, Council member, uh, in regard to your question, I can't break down further than the number I'm gonna provide in terms of how many of these permanent placements were to supportive housing placements. But we do know that a lot of individuals who are placed from the street into permanent housing uh, placements, uh, a great deal of them are into supportive housing. So in local law 19, uh, the agency is required to report quarterly on our work. Um, for the full fiscal year, of 2020, um, we placed 103 clients um, from the street into permanent housing, and that is um, uh, one subset of placements that are made from the street. We also have placements into transitional settings and then placements into other settings, um, which include um, hospital settings, uh, outpatient treatment. Um, so 103 for fiscal year 20, um, local law 19 is reported quarterly. Um, I thought I'd give you a full fiscal year instead of the first quarter of FY21, uh, but that report was recently submitted to the to the council. So 103 is just for supportive, not uh, medical, not in the hospital. Or so it's the 103 are permanent uh, housing placements of our street clients. Um, it does not include hospitals, but that 103 could potentially also include something other than supportive housing as a permanent housing placement. Okay, just one other question while I have you on. Um, it, let's talk about Kendra's law and how many times that was invoked in, uh, on the streets of, of New York City this year. Do you have that number? Where you... I don't have that number, council member. Okay, but do you know if it's being used? To, to, to If somebody is in dire need and you want to get them medication. Let's say you you uh, recognize mental illness, um, and they need to get some medication because they're doing various things, obviously, um, that are harmful both to themselves and to the public. Um, can we get that number? Because I, it seems to be uh, I'm not getting. You know, I get different uh, people telling me they can't get me that number. But can we get? Can you follow through and get that number? Uh, let me within... let me talk to the team and follow up with you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Maybe I'll go a second round if you if you have time. Okay. <clears throat> uh, do any other uh, council members have questions? Please raise your hand if you do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'll I'll continue asking questions here. Um, <clears throat> 
do we know how many um, individuals or, or households, families um, have um, have gone more than five years uh, with a completed 2010E that have not been placed in supportive housing? We would have to definitely look at our numbers to get back to you on that. We don't have that information on hand for this testimony. Um, if what would be the reasons for something like that to happen? Um, Could be any. Other words, how, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Well, I, I guess my question is, uh, why is it so much harder for some people to get placed in housing in supportive housing than others? Yes, I believe when Jennifer Kelly um, previously um, responded to this question, she alluded to it that there are a number of factors that come into play when someone is referred for supportive housing. The services that they may need, uh, where this uh, unit is located, is it uh, something that the client is even interested in or the, or the shelter? client is interested in? Is it something that works for both the provider and the shelter um, resident? So there are a number of reasons why um, somebody may cycle through and may not absolutely get that first fit. And when they apply, there could be any various number of reasons. Is there continuity with a caseworker of any kind? Um, somebody uh for example, has a 2010E <clears throat> filled out by a uh, street outreach worker, um, uh, do they, are they then assigned or um, to the CAP system, um, have any continuity of casework um, other than what's in the system? But I mean, do they have relationships with outreach workers or other types of staff um, that, take them through this process or are they kind of handed off from one agency or case worker to another um, without kind of that um, relationship? Because I, you know, talking, you know, obviously we're dealing with people with, with, um, uh, with, with mental health diagnoses and that's, you know, that sometimes requires additional level of, um, of, of continuity of care. Fully appreciate the question. And with the street outreach team for DHS, now we're going into DHS a little bit, so I don't want to get too far into that and speak for DHS, but with the outreach providers, they do have continuity generally because a lot of the street homeless, they tend to stay in certain areas. So what happens is that the outreach workers do work with them. They are familiar with them. They do follow them and ensure that if a housing application has been submitted, that there is that continuity with that actual outreach worker. Um, let me ask for a moment here, just a somewhat timely question, um, and maybe uh, Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater could speak on behalf of, of DHS. Um, uh, there's a storm um, coming like in the next couple of days, um, significant storm. Um, this will be the first uh, large uh, winter storm during COVID. Um, you know, in the past, um, individuals who were on the street, that would be, you know, and, and we're talking about, you know, people that are, we know are, are continuing to be on the street. This is the winter time. There are people that will be, you know, we know from doing hope counts every year, um, that there continue to be people that are on the street during cold weather. Um, but many, if it gets cold enough or the weather's bad enough, will go into the subways overnight. That's not an option right now. Um, or they could go into a drop-in center, but um, I would have concerns about social distancing and drop-in centers right now. I mean, you know, maybe we're addressing that, but uh, I'm not sure how. Um, uh, you know, uh, they would not be... You know, I mean, uh, hospitals are, are not in any position to be um, accepting people um, uh, just because they're outside. Um, 
especially right now. So what's the plan um, for Wednesday night when we have, you know, a blizzard? Thank you for the question. Our teams are certainly preparing uh, for the, the storm. Um, we do have drop-in centers open, operating at reduced capacity um, to permit social distancing. Um, and we continue to work um, with our outreach teams in terms of engaging individuals who are on the street. Um, as was reported earlier today, um, you know, we've had a lot of success with the additional safe haven and stabilization beds that we've brought on over the course of this past year um, and getting folks to accept a placement to come inside to those lower threshold model beds. Um, the storm will, you know, cause challenges, but we also recognize that, um, you know, we have ways to bring people inside. We have locations that we can, can bring them to um, and, you know, our teams will be out there um, with an all hands on deck. Uh, checking in on individuals who might refuse to come inside, and then certainly for those willing to accept to come inside to get them uh, uh, transferred to an indoor location. Um, I mean, how many, how are we social, how are we reducing capacity of, I mean, <clears throat> I think often, <clears throat> at least what I've seen in, in years past is on cold weather nights, especially like in Manhattan, um, uh, you know, uh, drop-in centers will be at capacity. Um, uh, and if it's, if that capacity is reduced in individual drop-in centers, um, without any of these other options really available, what's the, I mean, how, how is that possible? We couldn't be, you know, because it, 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 we're at capacity normally and the capacity is usually, I don't know, what's, what's the, what are we having, uh, uh, uh drop-in centers at capacity wise now? compared to normal percentage wise? Um, so the, I'd have to get the exact numbers and I do, I do have those numbers, um, but it's basically operating at 50% capacity for those sites. I mean, there's certain um, logistical layouts of each individual site that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, the number we, of pairs is reduced similar to the, um, the permanent shelters that we have operated ongoing during COVID. Um, so we just take those chairs sort of offline so they can't be used. Okay. Do, so we, but we don't have twice as many drop-in centers like in Manhattan than we than we normally do, right? So we do. We do from last winter have, I believe, one additional drop-in center. Again, I can I can pull the numbers up, um, and then you know, unlike last winter, we have the addition of the over a thousand safe haven and stabilization beds that have been brought on over the course of this year. That's a, you know, really necessary resource uh, for bringing people inside. So that, you know, sort of- how are, how are those capacity, This how, how are the additional safe haven and stabilization beds, what capacity were they at last night, for example? Uh, I don't or know in the last couple, that the last night that you have data for? Sure, I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't have that. Um, is there a post, is, is that flexible? Can we add additional safe haven or, or safe haven might be more difficult. Can we add stabilization beds, um, in the next 48 hours, uh, to handle like flex beds to handle an additional, uh, demand? I mean, we believe looking at our capacity right now that we have the capacity necessary to meet the demand. Um, certainly, you know, if, if we need to discuss what options are for flex beds to address a winter storm, um, that's something that the team can respond to. So what then would be the case if you're, if you're maxed out on your, on your, um, drop in center beds and you're maxed out on your existing safe haven and stabilization beds, what's, what is the, what's the, 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 the following contingency plan? So we continue to have placements in traditional shelters. So folks could come inside and be placed in a traditional shelter bed. A congregate um, shelter? Well, so a congregate shelter that's either operating at half capacity under COVID as they have been, or uh, they would be placed in a hotel if they have, if they, so when you're a single adult, you get your shelter assignment and that shelter assignment is good for a year. If this is a new individual coming into the system, they would come in through 30th Street and they get signed, uh, get assigned to an assessment shelter, um, as we would any client. I thought that people weren't. I thought oh, we were not having intakes through 30th Street right now. So Are we having 30. 
I mean, we're still utilizing 30th Street. If a client is new to DHS and coming indoors, um, we still have that, that centralized intake for clients to come into the system. And what capacity is the, is the assessment center at? So I do, I, across the system right now, I'm not prepared to answer questions on capacity. I'm happy to get back to you after the hearing and specific questions that you might have in respect to the capacity as it relates to the winter storm. But I'm not- Okay, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, maybe in the next 48 hours, we should really like have a, you know, a little bit more granular conversation offline about what the, the details are. Yeah, I, I, and just to be clear, it's not that those conversations aren't happening. I just didn't prepare for those conversations yeah, yeah. here at the hearing, but we're happy to get Understood. back. Understood, yeah, it's not the topic at the hearing. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Councilmember Holden and stand up. Bob, you're on mute. Okay, is that good? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, Commissioner Drinkwater, in engagements with street home homeless, when the outreach, um, maybe maybe this was answered. I'm sorry because I was in and out. What is the success rate in getting the homeless off the street? What percentage uh, is are the teams um, successful in getting um, individuals off the street? Do we have that? Commissioner Drinkwater, is she still there? Oh. Sorry about that. I had, I had muted my mic. Um, so as we've talked about, you know, each each case and each individual is different. Um, we I don't have the percentage numbers, but in local law 19, we speak about the total number of engagements that happen over the course of the fiscal year. So, for example, in fiscal year 20, there were 28,023 engagements to our street homeless population. Um, over the course of that same year, the total number of clients placed um, was 2,597. So, you know, the sort of multiple interactions that our teams have with individuals who are experiencing homelessness on the street, it might not be that first interaction, it might not be the second interaction, but our teams continue to go out with persistence and compassion to engage the clients, to build trust, and to really work with them um, to find the resource to bring them inside. Um, so again, the 28,000 is the total number of engagements. And from that, um, 2,597 clients were placed into a variety of options. So that could be a permanent housing option, that could be a transitional placement, or that could be a placement into other settings such as a hospital or an outpatient uh, placement. And, and how many not-for-profits are doing outreach on the street? Do we have a number on that? So we have uh, Breaking Ground and BRC, as well as the Manhattan Outreach Consortium, uh, who are doing outreach across the boroughs and then Project Hospitality in Staten Island as well. Right. Because, you know, if we can get um, a success rate on the not-for-profits, we can evaluate their performance. Do you keep track of that? Um, if, if, some, if one not-for-profit is doing much better than the other, uh, because of, of maybe the way they um, do the outreach or the way they talk to the street homeless. Sure. I mean, we work with our client or excuse me, our providers. Um, you know, they are contracted to do this work um, and we work to ensure that, you know, there are best practices across different providers, um, but also recognize that there can be, um, you know, differences of experience depending on the clients that a particular provider is working with. Um, and so, you know, can certainly talk more about that um, with you, but our, our contracted providers do have uh, the standards of the contract uh, that we work with them on. All right, one other question. There was a newspaper report earlier this month that said nearly 2,500 complaints to 311 um, about street homeless desperately needing help or causing problems have been closed without any action by obviously the police who, who no longer have jurisdiction. Um, could you, could you speak to that as to uh, why 2,500 complaints went unanswered? Um, so I, I can't speak to the NYPD's complaints. Um, when their calls to 311 and directed to our teams, our outreach teams work to go out um, and engage with clients um, who, you know, the report from 311 has come in on. Um, there are instances uh, that I know of where, you know, teams will go out and individual might move, um, but we do follow up um, and work to close out those cases when, you know, our teams have gone out. 
but but just tell me, take me through the process. So somebody calls nine one one, let's say, and it goes to the police for some reason when it shouldn't. Um, does that the, the police connect with your office or uh, or someone who can do the outreach or not for profit directly through three one one or nine one one, or is it? Are they 2,500 complaints, according to this article, were lost? Right. So I, I, I don't know the details of, of PD in terms of closing those complaints out or not. Um, if, if there are calls, as I understand it, to, to 911 that are a, a, a health or safety emergency, um, those are routed to uh, the appropriate uh, agency. So EMS, FDNY, NYPD. Um, for individuals experiencing homelessness and a homeless outreach uh, inquiry coming into 311, those are directed to our teams. Our teams are dispatched and work to engage the individual um, and again, offer them services. They might be known to our team. They might not be known to our team. In either event, we work to establish that trust and build that relationship to ultimately bring them inside. All right, because, because you know, according to the article, again, I'm, you know, I'm just uh, look, reading the article and it said, um, that uh, uh, de Blasio spokesperson said uh, they didn't deny that the complaints went unaddressed. And um, so, you know, and these are both 911 and 311. So we just really need to investigate if calls about uh, homeless uh, situations causing either harm to themselves or others, if they're not being addressed, then we need a better communication. And um, I, I think we have to look into that and find out did those calls go because the, the administration is not denying that some calls went un unaddressed. Uh, so we need to find out, is there a, a little gap here in the reporting system? I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to, uh, I'll be jumping around to make sure I'm uh, covering uh, the topics I need to be covering. Um, uh, before we let you all go. Um, so, oh, Councilmember Lander has questions. Go to Brad first. Thank you very much, Chair. I really appreciate your convening this hearing and just all the leadership that you have shown in pushing our council to do better by homeless folks and those who need supportive uh, and affordable housing. And thank you to the administration for being here. Um, I had to, to jump off for a minute, so it's possible that this got addressed, but if it didn't, I do want to ask about it. Um, and that is um, thinking about the effort to um, acquire and convert some of the hotels uh, that are you know, in distress at this time to be supportive housing for the future. Now, obviously that's a separate question uh, from the conversations we've had in the past, some of which got contentious about deploying hotels more immediately. I'm, I'm leaving that aside for a minute, obviously that, you know, but we all know that including some of the hotels that are being used currently for homeless folks, but also there's just a much broader set of hotels in distress at this time. I think we know that the industry, the hotel industry is going to be slow in recovery and coming back as tourism is overall. And we are going to need a lot more units of supportive housing than we have. And so that's not going to get anybody a supportive housing unit, you know, tonight or next month, but it does seem like there is an opportunity here to significantly increase the footprint of supportive uh, housing that we have in New York City that we won't have if we can't move quickly, even though that's gonna require like long-term planning and more money that's on the table at a time when resources are scarce. Um, but if we're serious about ending homelessness and about scaling up the, the, and you know, we'll need to work with the state, obviously operating resources would be needed in addition to capital. You know, we, we could have a whole hearing on this topic but I guess I at least want to make sure we know, you know, uh, the, I think Vicki Bean, had, uh, Deputy Mayor Bean had talked about this back in the spring, but I haven't seen that much on it recently. And so I just want to know, um, you know, is there a planning or a meaningful effort underway, not just to do, you know, one or two hotels, which, which, which would be good with individual providers, but to really use this moment to significantly scale up our supportive housing uh, footprint. So I would defer that question to Emily Lehman from HPD, who may be able to answer about building capacity and the work we've done on that on the part of HPD. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, so we are always looking for opportunities to expand our toolbox to create more affordable and supportive housing. 
Um, and we do recognize that the hospitality and hotel industries have been hit particularly hard by COVID. Um, so we are certainly looking into the viability of um, helping to acquire and convert hotels to housing. Um, you know, we are we have received a number of proposals and are reviewing them on a case by case basis. Um, each site has a different set of circumstances um, that we're evaluating for viability. Um, so far, most of the proposals we've seen have required a substantial amount of investment of city resources. Um, and so we are, are evaluating that um, okay. along with our already very robust pipeline. Well, let me ask you a question about that because, I mean, of course, they'll take significant resources. And I get that a lot of the hotels, especially those that might be in distress, would, would be the ones that would need more work. And, you know, they'll have a bathroom, but they might not have a kitchen. So there's a whole range of issues that I could understand. Um, and obviously at the moment, if we were going to substantially grow the pipeline, like one, we don't have the capital and the budget to do. We've got folks that have been waiting to build supportive housing in the pipeline already, and I don't want them getting bumped. Um, but I guess I think it is worth looking at from a slightly different angle, which is if we know we need a lot more supportive housing, maybe we should develop like an acquisition approach um, that doesn't try to underwrite each deal now in the way that you would, that isn't going to take money that was needed to renovate a different, you know, supportive house. I mean, there's obviously a threshold question. Can they be done at scale in a way that's more cost effective over the long term than like building from the ground up or taking a different development approach? But it seems to me worth asking that question. I guess what I want to know is I want an analysis. Is this an opportunity such that if we miss it, we're going to have missed the opportunity to do a significant amount of supportive housing. And if it is that opportunity, what would it look like to put additional dollars in for rapid acquisition, even if we might not be able to do the renovation, uh, you know, even if the renovation would need to be on a slower timeline and, and with additional resources? Yeah, that is something that we are definitely looking into. Um, I, you know, we've seen a variety of proposals um, proposing different things, some proposing um, acquisitions and then holding the site um, for a period of time while we wait for the capital availability, um, others that might be available more immediately with um, limited to no um, capital work. Um, so we're, we're still evaluating um, as they come. Okay. Can I, I'll, I won't take more time here, but if I could just ask if you would come back to us, like I think this is one where we would, you know, and, and, and this could be with, with the chair here in general welfare, obviously this is a housing issue uh, as well, but I just, I, you know, this is one that I, I think could easily slip because there's so many more urgent issues. I mean, the chair is rightly focused on what's happening tonight as the snow and the cold hit, and that is urgent to save people's lives tonight. So you could see why we would miss the longer term opportunity. And I just want to make sure we, as the council, try to act as a, you know, a, a vehicle of oversight to make sure we're also paying attention to what we need for the longer term. So let me just request that if HPD and the administration would be willing at a future point to brief the council uh, on this, we don't need to have a whole hearing on it, though we could, but uh, uh, we would love to stay in the loop and understand how you guys are thinking about it. And, you know, that's going to be a relevant capital budget issue as we start to gear up for, um, for next year's budget as well. So sure, we'd be happy to. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair, for staying focused on what matters in our city. Thank you very much, Councilmember Landry. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, I will be uh, hopping around a little bit here. Um, first one to ask, there's a, um, uh, an issue around, I just want to make sure we're, we're clear on, um, uh, I, I, H, we're hearing that HRA is not allowing electronic signature for supportive housing consents, um, which is the, the document that is required to start a supportive housing application. Um, I know that um, some organizations are having challenges because they're, um, they're finding it difficult to meet their clients in person. Um, do you know if that's the case? Michael Boskett can respond to that question. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I'm actually conferring right now with the director of the unit to see if we are allowing electronic signatures or not. I should hear back momentarily. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, 
uh, he's raising his hand. If we could unmute Craig Rexlitz, he could actually address that question better than I can. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so uh, we are able to accept uh, electronics. Our, what, what, our, um, what our understanding is, is that there is software that allows people to electronically sign documents such as the consent. We need the client's signature on the consent in order to have the client's legal consent in order to proceed with the application. Um, so I wanna make sure we're being very clear about what is being reported. If they're not able to get an electronic signature on our document, then they would need a wet signature on the document in order to make it a legal document. But you know, from our legal, we were advised that we do need the client's signature on the consent form. So I think that um, I hope that clarifies, you know, what um, you know when the issue was brought up to us. You know, what is the option here? So if the say the provider who is working with the client has the ability to um, obtain an electronic signature on the consent from the client, then that would be a legal consent from the client in order up for us to proceed with the application. I'm sorry, then, sorry and under what circumstances then are, uh, is, a, is a, a handwritten signature required? If they're not able to, uh, uh, obtain an electronic signature on the document, then they would actually need the client's signature on the consent form. Okay, but one or the other is sufficient. So if they can, if they can get an electronic signature, that's sufficient. That is sufficient. Okay. Um, all right. I think that uh, we'll we'll try to make that uh, make sure that that's the case in practice. And because we were hearing from providers that there were some challenges. Um, around um, around getting elect or having electronic signatures uh, accepted. So, yeah, we were getting reports that what they wanted was a waiver on getting any signature on the consent form, which we could not okay. grant. Sure, but Understood. if you yeah. have a, like a DocuSign or something like that, then you would be able to obtain a signature from the client. Um, without mm -hmm. a wet signature. Okay, great. That's great to hear. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, uh, okay, so these are going to be kind of uh, general questions now. Um, do we have a chart that shows um, the number for just NYC 1515, so just the city program? the number of congregate units and the number of scatter site units respectively that have been funded funded in the pipeline and cited and, and built um, for each of those um, uh, for each of those types of housing and whether and how that tracks um, compared to the annual or semi-annual um, goals that the administration has set. Is there well, any? Is there, is, does that exist? Just to be clear, are you referring to New York City fifteen fifteen? Is that what? Correct. Correct. That's so yes, we did provide those numbers in testimony, and okay, and in that we indicated how many have been awarded, how many um, are built, how many are in the pipeline, and we are at least one third towards the way of meeting that goal. But you're asking okay. for this in a chart form? Uh, that would, we could probably, using the data, we'll, we'll see how we can work that okay. together and, um, and see if, if, if we need any additional information. Okay, great. Um, and, but that's, in the testimony, I'm sorry, that was broken down by scatter site and congregate? We did, yes, we talked about, okay. I believe we did, but if it's not there, just let us know and we will, you know, sure. provide you accordingly. 
but I um, believe it was. By the way, uh, Mr. Rechless, I, I, um, uh, I believe you weren't sworn in, actually. And so the, our, our, the council to our committee actually needs to retroactively swear you in. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, Mr. Rechels. Thank you. Um, uh, how many uh, FY, 50, uh, sorry, how many New York City 1515 uh, congregate units have, have closed on financing in FY20 so far? Or I'm sorry, we're in 21, in FY20. I would defer to Emily Lehman in terms of financing to respond to that question from HBD. She's from HBD. Okay. Um, so for fiscal year 20, which ended um, at the end of June, um, HPD financed over 600 units of congregate supportive housing. Um, this includes units funded through the NYC 1515 program, state and federal resources, um, as well as the preservation of existing supportive housing. Um, it's important to note that due to the impacts of COVID, we did experience a slowdown in production um, in the second half of FY20, um, but we're in the middle of a, an extremely ambitious closing season right now. Um, and so while those units will count toward fiscal year 21, we look forward to sharing those numbers with you in the new year. Thank you. And Chair um, Kevin, just going yes. back to your previous question, through October 2020, we have awarded 5,306 1515 units to providers, including 1,255 scattered site and 4,051 congregate. Okay. Thank you. Um, so moving on to um, a couple questions around CAPS. Um, we have heard stories from advocates previously that supporting, this is going back to our, I don't know if, um, I think Annette, you were at our last hearing several years ago um, that was on site at um, the Skimmerhorn. Yes. Um, so we, I remember hearing a lot of uh, stories then about um, applicants who are rejected for reasons that appear to go against the spirit of supportive housing, for example, rejections because somebody was intoxicated or showing symptoms or didn't have uh, quote unquote insight into their illness or showed up to the interview in pajamas or you know things of that sort. Um, how does HRA, I mean, obviously these, you know, the purpose of supportive housing um, and um, uh, is, is to provide housing services to people um, experiencing mental health issues. So um, how are we making sure that um, uh, providers aren't just rejected because a client might be seen as difficult to serve and how has the standardized vulnerability index impacted this issue? Well, thank you for that question. We have worked tremendously since that last hearing based on you know, what we heard from providers, from advocates, in regards to rejections of clients for supportive housing um, and the reasons for those rejections, as you pointed out, poor insight, what did that actually mean? So Michael Boskett and his team worked collectively as they rolled out CAPS and the SBA to address all of those concerns. And I will let Michael um, respond further. I'm sorry, council member, could you repeat the question? Just uh, how, how does HRA ensure that providers aren't just re rejecting clients because they might be seen as difficult to serve and how has the standardized vulnerability index impacted this issue? Um, actually, the first part of the question, I'm gonna defer to um, uh, Commissioner Kelly, but I'll answer the, um, the section related to the standardized vulnerability assessment. So the standardized vulner vulnerability assessment um, is a tool that uses Medicaid utilization, um, functional limitations, touches by systems, um, as well as other indicators that um, a special chief 
uh, Holmes had in her testimony. Um, that SVA, as we called it, ends up with an index of a high, medium, or low in terms of the individual's vulnerability for continued chronic homelessness. So we believe that those clients who are all score a high, as an example, all have equal um, vulnerability in terms of uh, remaining chronically homeless. And if we're using that as a tool to sort of leverage the playing field, all of the clients who score a similar vulnerability assessment would be essentially in a similar situation. And I'll ask uh, Ms. Kelly to address the referral process. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, council member. So as, as Ms. Holmes stated, we, um, we are looking at this very closely. We have been looking at this very closely and we have implemented many changes. Um, as part of 1515, we're working in very close partnership with the um, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So, um, you know, when they, they review all interview results at this point. So if, if anything comes in that, that looks like it, it needs some further investigation or clarification, they will step in and do that. So, um, you know, that, that's just part of our process. My colleague Gail is here and, and we send them all directly to her. She sees them all. Um, in addition, I, we have also made a lot of changes in our interview practices that I think are, are geared more towards really a client-centered approach on this. We are, um, you know, since COVID really is why we implemented this, but we're intending to move it forward. We have virtual interviews, which enable clients to have, I think, their support in their home shelter or with their case manager near them. I think it's less anxiety producing. We're seeing less no-shows. So these are all things that we're trying to do to you know, lessen client barriers to housing, recognizing that this is a vital resource for many. Um. <clears throat> Is DSS able through CAPS to identify individuals who have been rejected frequently um, from units? Yes, they can. I kind of asked this before. Yes, okay. they can. Um, what, what is then, what type of, oh, Michael Boskett is looking to oh. speak to that as well. I just want to um, refresh that I had responded to a question earlier about reporting out of CAPS. The system is relatively new, only implemented on the 26th of October. Um, and so the intent is that we would be able to produce reports like that, but it may be a while until we can. Okay. Um, oh, uh, and what, what, what kind of assistance is offered to, to um, the individuals if, they're, if CAPS is identifying them as being frequently so that again would go to um, Deputy Commissioner um, Jennifer Kelly's area in terms of ensuring that we are making referrals for these individuals and have and provide them with every opportunity to um, interview for units that they would be appropriate for or, or suited for. So what we do try to do is ensure that referrals are made and we follow up with those referrals to ensure that any rejections, if they are rejected, are appropriate. And again, as Jennifer spoke earlier, they do go over to DOHMH and Gail Wolf's area, reviews them, and if there's any concern about a provider, then they will um, reach out to them. Okay, I mean, it's, it's something that I think would be, that would be an area where I think that we would be, uh, it would be helpful to have kind of what I, if, what's the um, feedback um, mechanism for uh, HRA DSS to hear from providers, advocates um, uh, on challenges that they are seeing within the system? Is there like a, an ongoing working group with providers and advocates, like a supportive housing? Um, just so that there's a kind of uh, means or mechanism to um, get feedback if, if, you're, if things aren't necessarily going the way that they're supposed to be going. So as um, Deputy Commissioner Basket pointed out, the system is fairly new when we rolled it out. We have been in 
um, constant communication with the providers. Um, I will let him speak further to any outreach that we've had with them and the, con the plan for continued outreach. So we do have a CAPS committee that consists of community members and um, COC and, and other city agencies where we can discuss these things and address the, and, and talk about these topics. Um, okay. And we, do you have any okay. like, do you have any like, uh, like, I don't say like adversarial perspectives in that, in that group, like people that are like, you know, willing to help the agency a little bit. Uh, as I said, there are community-based members who are in that group. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Cause you know, sometimes we just, we'll hear from advocates that are working, you know, on the ground with clients that might not be, of housing providers you know they they may be groups that are kind of like working with with uh individual clients uh you know uh it's always good to have like a little bit of um you know friction it's like my, you know my, my dad always says that like the friction is what makes the pearl you know uh, a pearl you know it's the, it's the grain of sand that's that annoying grain of sand so mm -hmm. i would encourage you to include that grain of sand in in your process. Make sure that you're getting um, that perspective. We do hear from providers. Um, we do hear from some of them who have challenges and have issues and have concerns about the system. They do reach out to us. Um, we do take what they say um, their concerns seriously. We do work with them to assist them with individual clients. And some of them, as you say, are on the ground. So we do hear from them. And we, as I stated, we really do listen to them. And that friction is helpful. I would agree with you with that because it helps us look at it from a different angle. Thank you. Um, can I, um, we've heard from advocates that they see different populations being disproportionately um, rejected for um, for reasons that shouldn't that are not having to do with their disability. Um, uh, they're not only having sorry not only having to do with their disability, but also their age, gender, income status. Um, how what kind of quality control does HRA have to ensure that there's no discrimination against um, gender, income, or age? So as Jennifer Kelly um, alluded to earlier, there are a variety of reasons why an individual could be rejected for supportive housing. And there's also different funding streams. So depending on the funding streams, the income comes into play. Again, when we are looking at rejections, we do send those rejections over to DOHMH so that they can look at these rejections and determine if there's any trends or anything that needs to be addressed with a provider. Um, Gail Wolfs could um, elaborate further. If we could, un um, okay, go ahead. Um, that's a great question. So as Jennifer and Annette said, any we receive the uh, manifest from all of the interviews and if we see any trends if providers are not accepting a tenant who meets the eligibility criteria and is able to live safely independently we follow up with that provider and request that they re-interview sometimes there are times when the room is already rented. So the tenant may have to wait, the applicant may have to wait for the next opening, but providers are expected to accept all tenants. If the room, there's, as Jennifer said, there's three applicants for each room. So they may have to wait for the next room. So not being accepted for a room is not a denial always. It may mean that there's a different applicant who's accepted for this and then they can re-interview or just be accepted on a waiting list for the next. But all of those are reviewed by DOHMH and providers are asked to re-interview anybody who meets the criteria and is able to live safely. Um, 
Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, I, I want to ask about uh, uh, um, evictions and um, or discharges from supportive housing. What um, what are the protections that clients have uh, from being evicted um, from supportive housing? First of all, and, um, supportive housing is permanent housing. I would just like to point that out. So, you know, I know sometimes there's misinformation in the community that they, that community um, residents may think that, com that supportive housing is shelter or some sort of temporary housing. It is permanent housing. And as such, anyone who is in supportive housing is afforded the same rights as any other tenant in New York City. And, on, and in regards to supportive housing, we would expect our providers to work with individuals who are having issues, either paying rent, behavioral issues, any other type of substance use issues, any other type of issues that they may have. The supportive housing providers should be working with that individual to address um, the concerns. This is why it is called supportive housing. And there is a robust, um, suite of services that are available to them. And before they could even consider um, pursuing eviction, they would have to reach out to DOHMH, HRA, to say, what have you done to work with this individual to maintain them? Because the goal is not to have them go back into shelter, but to remain in some sort of independent housing that can provide them with the services that they need. Gail, would you like to elaborate further? Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is that even if a provider is taking somebody through housing court, they still must continue to attempt to reach out, engage that tenant, and try to help that tenant address the issues so that they can stay in housing even if there's a situation where it has gotten to housing court. So services are continuous until that tenant is no longer living in that apartment. So even if there's that situation, it's very important to be aware the provider is still serving that tenant. Um, does, does, uh, do either agencies uh, track the number of evictions that uh, occur out of supportive housing every year? We, we don't track the I'm sorry, Gail, go ahead. I'm sorry, we don't track that information. Okay. Um, so do we have any idea of how much, it ha how often it happens or the number of instances per year? We can try to get that data and get that back to you. Okay. Um, uh, I lost my turn of thought for a second. Um, oh, uh, with rights that, um, that people have, um, I mean, there are different rights that tenants enjoy, um, in different types of housing in New York. So, um, uh, do, do residents as supportive housing have the same rights as like a rent stabilized tenant or a non rent stabilized tenant, because like a rent stabilized tenant has, um, you know, ha cannot be evicted. You know, has a much it's a much higher bar to evict a uh, a rent stabilized tenant um, uh, from housing in New York. Do we? I mean, is there? I I think this is one of the reasons why um, the Bill of Rights is, is something that we were, we would want to look at is. Um, making sure that tenants know what their rights are under under New York City housing law. And I guess one other follow-up question to that would be for scatter sites, do they have, are they the tenant of, of record? Do they have rights to uh, as rent like a rent stabilized tenant or is it, is it the agency that is the tenant of record? So in regards to the second question, I will start with that one first. The lease is in the name of the agency who leased the name for scatter site. And in that particular case, um, the stabilization 
rules do not apply because it's in the name of an agency. Um, in regards to the first part of the question, could you repeat that? Just uh, whether they enjoy the rights of rent stabilized tenants or or non rent stabilized tenants, because those those rights are different under, under state law. I, I'm not familiar with that. Gail, do you know the answer to that? Uh, I, I believe that it would depend on the funding for the building. It may be different in each building, but every tenant has full tenant rights, be they in scattered site or in a single site building. Um, so I, we may have tenants yeah. who are under yeah. rent stabilization, but that would be, I think, specific to each building. Um, okay, well, uh, th these are some questions I think we maybe have to dig in a little bit further okay. on because I just want to I want to make sure like, you know, uh, what the rights like what their rights are. Um, uh, it's again, if you're a rent stabilized tenant in New York City, um, your rights are much more extensive um, than a non rent stabilized tenant. Um, just across the board. Um, Uh, I just want to ask a couple more questions about the, the bills and then I'll, I'll let you all go. Um, um, I'm, uh, a little confused by the, the testimony on um, on the, on the uh, intro 2176 uh, having to do with the tenant's bill of rights. Um, what specifically are the concerns of the administration? Um, I think um, uh, uh, Officer Holm, you mentioned that in your testimony that there were some concerns around uh, different jurisdictions or... Um, Correct. I um, will defer to Erin Drinkwater to respond in regards to the bills. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So one of the concerns was as written, um, we believe this would set up a different standard between those units administered uh, through the state's ESHI program as compared to those um, uh, administered by uh, New York City. Uh, we would be interested in exploring opportunities to potentially uh, get something passed at the state level. So that way all all units would be covered as opposed to just a subset of them. Um, we also wanna make sure that the information that's being shared uh, with each of the tenants uh, is information um, that does not end up in a you know, voluminous catalog uh, that's not you know, easily acquired. Um, some of that information is already uh, readily available uh, in other areas. Um, and so we wanna to work to strike a balance between uh, providing what is I think very helpful and being transparent and making sure that tenants have information um, about uh, their unit. Um, also balancing that with concerns around privacy, places where information is already posted uh, under, you know, DOHMH or HPD uh, requirements as well. I'll also just, if I can, one other concern is, as we read the bill, the understanding um, that it would create a separate system um, of complaints uh, separate and apart from the Department of Constituent Services, which was just codified under law um, by this council a couple of years ago, um, and concerned about creating a duplicative system that would be costly uh, during this time. Um, okay, and then uh, the other the other bill um, around. Um, uh, uh, Police engagement on um, suites, if, if you will, or uh, you know, engagement with um, uh, street homelessness. Um, the reason why uh, we're looking at at uh, um, losing this legislation is that um, you know during the budget, uh, the FY twenty one budget, it was our understanding that. Um, New York City Police Department was no longer going to be um, engaging in going out to do um, sweeps or whatever whatever terminology you want to use. Um, 
but we still continue to to see that happen in cases. And um, you know, we know that that, that from our understanding, there was an MOU that was discontinued between uh, DSS and NYPD, um, but um, there are still instances where where police are are engaging. So, can, um, can you speak a little bit more about um, specifically what the um, opposition to this bill would be, considering that um, it is the policy, I think, of the administration under the our understanding of the dissolution of the MOU and as part of the FY21 budget, um, that police should aren't supposed to have any role in this uh, in any type of outreach. So as um, uh, Chief Holm acknowledged in the testimony, there are instances in which, um, so broadly speaking, our outreach teams are working 24 seven um, canvassing the city to engage individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, as was noted um, in the testimony, there are times where um, our outreach workers um, have either, you know, there's been a, a threat of violence made or there's been a, pri a, a prior experience uh, with violence where we want to balance both continuing to engage the client, ensuring that um, we're checking on them, their health and well-being, continuing to engage that client, and also balancing the uh, need to ensure um, the safety of our providers. Um, there are other instances in which um, if uh, outreach workers, um, although again, trained to de-escalate situations, um, that even that rigorous training might not always be sufficient. Um, and having uh, that police escort um, is important. There's also um, important work that happens in the behavioral health um, realm um, in which the co-response teams um, do partner with the PD in terms of some of the behavioral health responses um, and making sure that clients um, are getting the, the services that they need. Um, so I think the concern is, is that by categorically taking it out, um, it uh, creates challenges in terms of the balance and impeding achieving our goals, which is working to engage the clients, um, ensuring that our staff and our providers are also safe, and then um, you know, maintaining sort of the safety of the general public as well. Um, we don't have all of the agencies who would be impacted by this bill today at the hearing, including some of our partners like EMS and FDNY. Um, DOH of MH is here, but I know that Gail is, is you know, one, one program within DHS, or excuse me, DOH MH and, and not this particular one. Um, similarly, Parks Department. Um. <clears throat> Are there any instances, how many, how many times or what percentage of the time um, in the past year has um, NYPD um, uh, been engaged on a, on a call regarding uh, a, a person on the street? I don't have that number today. Um, if we could get that information, how, like how many, basically how many calls uh, that DHS went out on involved, also involved NYPD? Sure, so I think something that's important to note is the work that our outreach teams are doing um, independent of calls that could be made from community members to um, EMS or 911 uh, and where NYPD is responding. Um, NYPD would respond to um, something within their jurisdiction, irrespective of somebody's housing status. Um, but I can certainly see what data we have and, and what we can get back to you with. Is NYPD ever responding to a, um, uh, a call, um, regard, like a 311 call about somebody's, uh, that somebody is uh, homeless and taking up the sidewalk or something like that, where it's not, not a 911 call, but a 311 call? So NYPD ever respond to those? I unfortunately can't answer questions for NYPD today. Um, do, do outreach uh, workers uh, provide soft services such as blankets, socks, feminine hygiene products, et cetera, if an unsheltered individual uh, rejects 
entering shelter? Sure. So part of part of building the relationship uh, with a client can can look many different ways, um, and it has included um, giving out water bottle on code red days, um, socks and the like, um, feminine hygiene products, etc. So that is that is permitted. Yes. Okay. Does it does it happen? Is that something that uh, yeah. okay? Um, is that a change of policy? I know a couple of years ago they were, uh, that was not the official policy at DHS. So we had um, had um, supplies available at safe havens and drop-in centers. Um, there were times where things like socks would be given out. Um, last year we worked uh, with advocates. Uh, to expand um, our partnership with one of the uh, philanthropic organizations that we work with in terms of getting additional socks, for example. Um, when DHS engages with a client on the street, are they um, individ are individuals counseled on the different types of services and shelters that are available to them? So are they counseled about that that there are in fact safe haven uh, beds available, that there are, in fact, uh, stabilization beds available, et cetera? Sure. I mean, that's part of building the relationship um, and working to, to meet the clients where they're at. I mean, part of one of the things that has been, you know, what we need more of, but has also been impressive is by bringing on the additional stabilization and safe haven beds, right? There are times where a client will say, I want to come inside but that sort of latter half of that sentence is I want to come inside in the neighborhood that I've been, you know, accustomed to and engaged in for the last, you know, X period of time. Um, if we don't have capacity in that neighborhood on a particular night, um, we miss the opportunity to bring a client inside. Our goal and what we're seeing by the increase of safe haven and stabilization beds is that clients are coming inside and they're coming inside and able to be placed in, you know, locations that are familiar to them. Um, and I think it, it's also worth noting that, you know, there are clients who, um, you know, we as the public might see on the street during the daytime. It doesn't mean that they don't have a placement. It doesn't mean that, you know, they still aren't going to locations that might be um, prime for panhandling um, and that sort of thing. Um, but yes, I mean, we work to, to share with clients um, and individuals on the street the sort of um, you know, variety of options that are available to them. Um, you know, drop-in centers, church beds. And if I can, while well, I just mentioned drop-in centers, um, I just wanted to update my response about the, the, the drop-in centers and chairs. So we actually have uh, about the same number of chairs as we did last year compared to this year. And that's because we've actually opened additional locations. So it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a reduced number of chairs. It's actually about the same number of chairs, just at, a, at multiple more locations. Um, can we just, uh, I just want to ask a, a couple more questions um, regarding, um, uh, this is within the context of this bill, um, chronically, uh, chronically homeless, uh, our definition of chronically homeless and, and uh, um, are, can you explain what the definition of chronically homeless is and are we using that definition to uh, um, currently uh, during COVID um, for eligibility to enter a safe haven or a stabilization bed? I'd have to get back to you on that. Because uh, I know that that's been a, I mean, that's been a longstanding criteria for entering a safe haven, um, at least pre-COVID, was um, right. our understanding of chronically homeless was, um, you know, I think it was cited three times, um, no shorter than over a period of nine months. Right. Um, I mean, the, the, just... the definition of chronically homeless hasn't changed. Um, I just want to get back to you in terms of your question about the, the COVID response in mm -hmm. particular. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, if we could, uh, I'd be interested to know that. Um, okay. Uh, those are all the questions uh, for me. Uh, do any other council members have questions for the panel? Okay, um, seeing none, I wanna thank you all very much for your testimony and for uh, answering the questions of the committee. And I look forward to working with you, um, not only on these 
piece of legislation, but on um, uh, the issues that we've all uh, been talking about today and trying to build a better system um, that we can um, help ensure um, our take, we're taking care of the most vulnerable people in New York City. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm, we're going to take a, a, a four minute break, four or five minute break, and uh, we'll return for public testimony.
Okay, everybody, thank you very much for your patience. Um, I'll turn it now over to Amit Kilowong, Committee Council, uh, to call the first public panel. We are now going to turn to public testimony. I'm gonna be calling on individuals one by one and panelists will have three minutes to testify. We ask that you limit your testimony to three minutes. And as always, you can submit longer written testimony for the record. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. And please know that there is a slight delay with the unmuting function. Our first four panelists are going to be in this order. Theodora Ranelli, 
Craig Hughes, Giselle Ruthier, and Eric Lee. I will now call on Theodora Ranelli to testify. Hi, um, my name is Theodora Ranelli, and I am a tenant in Scattered Site Supportive Housing, and I will be speaking today in that capacity. Um, first, I would like to thank Councilmember Levin and his staff for holding this oversight hearing and working with advocacy groups to advance this legislation. As a supportive housing tenant, I have experienced how difficult it has been to get real clarity on our rights as tenants, and I think this bill takes an important step in the right direction by requiring this information to be provided to us up front. Building on this foundation, I offer these suggestions which would strengthen the legislation by allowing supportive housing tenants to actually use and enforce the rights outlined in this legislation. So my first suggestion is to require supportive housing providers to comply with the Bill of Rights. Um, my primary feedback on this bill is that I would strongly encourage the council not only to require supportive housing providers to inform us of our rights, but also that the providers comply with the rights outlined. One of the most difficult things about being a supportive housing tenant is that every issue that arises with respect to our housing is mitigated through nonprofit social service providers. Particularly in scattered site supportive housing, tenants are encouraged or even required to bring any housing issues to case managers or on-site housing liaisons, many of whom do not respond to our concerns or have policies which directly contradict our tenant rights. As a result, whether the rights outlined in this bill are enforceable for tenant housing supportive housing tenants depends on whether or not nonprofit providers are required to follow them. At present, nothing in this bill requires them to do so, and I hope for future drafts of this legislation will consider this addition. And my second recommendation is to include anti-retaliation provisions. Um, in addition, I strongly encourage the council to incorporate an anti-retaliation clause that would support would prevent supportive housing providers from harassing or displacing tenants who report a provider for failure to comply with this legislation. It is no secret that supportive housing tenants citywide have suffered and continue to suffer from retaliation by nonprofit service providers when they assert their tenant rights. This has a chilling effect on supportive housing tenants ability to self advocate and it is directly counterproductive to the intent of this legislation. Um, since this legislation is primarily enforceable through a tenant's grievance process, strong anti-retaliation measures are essential to ensuring its effectiveness. And I would also add that, um, that it is technically permanent housing, but that depends on whether the prices negotiated with the nonprofit and the landlord are sustainable for the nonprofit and sustainable for the landlord. So it's support, it's um, permanent housing in that regard only. Um, and I want to thank you for your opportunity to testify today and for your efforts to ensure that supportive housing tenants have the same rights as all New York City tenants. Thank you. Theodora, thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanna um, uh, thank you for your testimony here as well as your um, uh, your willingness to uh, uh, speak the other day we spoke for um uh, some time about uh provisions of this legislation and um uh, they were all very well thought out and constructive and i think would the uh the ideas that you raise and and, and have raised will will make this a, a better bill so i want to thank you very much for for the, the time and attention that you spent on this thank you again theodora I'll now call on Craig Hughes, followed by Giselle Ruthier. Over to Craig Hughes. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, uh, Aminta Chair Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee for holding the hearing today. My name is Craig Hughes. I'm a social worker at the Safety Net Project at the Urban Justice Center. I'll start this testimony by noting that it's uh, less than 40 degrees outside and raining. Temperatures are dropping or freezing as the sun goes down and heavy snow will fall uh, in at least two days this week. New York City has no serious plan to ensure homeless people are able to get warm, specifically in context of the COVID crisis and corresponding reduction of accessible spaces to folks on the street. In sum, there's no serious plan to ensure people won't freeze to death. And according to reporting in the Daily News, we know that at least one person has died so far related to cold temperatures this year. 
One reason for this is the governor's decision to shut down subways, which have provided the only overnight heating source for many homeless folks. Another reason is that Mayor de Blasio has simply refused to contract hotels or other spaces to ensure sufficient individual rooms are made available for homeless people during the crisis. New York City simply also refuses to embrace a housing first approach, which is evidence-based and means providing housing first and foremost and services from there. While we've seen one reported death, we will likely see others. And this is the outcome of a pervasive and avoidable failure on the de Blasio administration. Individuals and families on the street find themselves navigating a bureaucratic and blame heavy maze when they try to come inside. Individuals face a homeless services system that has extended policing into the center of its outreach processes, where city contracted agencies work hand in hand with sanitation and the NYPD to toss people's belongings and move them from site, and where agencies still require multiple engagements to place someone into a safe haven or stabilization bed. To be clear, this is the direct outcome of DHS not requiring its contracted outreach teams to house people first and most, first and most importantly, and also the de Blasio administration's utter refusal to ensure that supportive housing landlords don't make it virtually impossible for someone to come on the street, someone on the street to come inside. Indeed, they are given, uh, they are even, uh, they're not even concerned enough about this to bother systematically collecting the data for analysis. And it was testified to today, the CAP system that is not currently, the CAP system is not currently equipped to provide necessary data on provider level rejections. Whether we will ever get this data can't be left to a voluntary choice on the part of DSS. That's a feature and not a bug or deficit in the CAP system and placement processes, especially given the extensive input and decision-making power granted supportive housing industry reps in, in designing the CAP system. Undoubtedly, there's far more need for supportive housing units than there's supply of the supportive housing units. But acknowledging the difference between supply and demand is almost always where the conversation ends. That needs to change. And as years of data released to us has shown, and for which I can test to being a social worker for more than a decade, folks on the street are least likely to be accepted by, into supportive housing by a provider. Until the city is willing to seriously address the almost unbelievable amount of discretion it grants to supportive housing landlords to curate who lives in their buildings, we will simply never come near resolving the crisis of street homelessness in New York City. In relation to folks on the street, too often we hear of the need to build a trust or rapport and, and the difficulties the city has with that. But we hear so much, we hear so much in fact, because it actually functions as a way to tuck away the bureaucratic maze of some who want uh, to come inside and shift blame onto those without homes rather than the city agency or contracted providers tasked with helping them inside. We need to- Craig, you can finish your testimony. You can go ahead and finish your test. I mean, don't, you don't, go ahead and finish all you have, it's fine. Oh, okay, thank you. That's very generous. I, I'm not gonna take too much longer. Um, but thank you. We need to speak more of, uh, did you offer this person a safe individual room? Did you help them get placed into supportive housing first? Or is New York City really running a system where the reality is, in fact, housing last, if ever? I would put forth that it's the latter. While outreach teams do truly vital work, it's undeniable how much under Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Banks, the city has designed its outreach teams to function as a soft arm of the cops. And it's undeniable that while supportive housing providers do life-saving work, the city has across the board failed homeless people and those in the un in supportive housing units by refusing to ensure these individuals don't face creaming or discrimination at the door or retaliation or evictions on their way out. By looking at supportive housing as solely a type of social service, we've forgotten that the fundamental power dynamic is that of gatekeeping who can get in and the power dynamic inherent in who can evict and who can be evicted. Supportive housing providers provide necessary services, unquestionably, but they're also landlords and they act like typical landlords far too often. If we don't acknowledge that in every conversation and begin to confront it, we are failing homeless people and formerly homeless people, period. In relation to this legislation, we're in support of the two bills today and in support of passing intro 47, which would require data on supportive housing rejections and which has languished in this committee for more than two years, in large part due to the pushback of the supportive housing industry. Quite literally, this is simply a reporting bill about who is accepted or not accepted into supportive housing. It's been fiercely resisted by the city and supportive housing industry reps. And given the importance of supporting housing in resolving homelessness in New York City, it's almost unbelievable how little data we have about who actually gets it and who gets evicted out. We support the outreach bill because it would reduce NYPD contact with people on the street and that's a net win. NYPD has absolutely no legitimate role or helpful role in outreach. However, we would caution on two ends. First, this is not an anti-sweeps bill, which is what's needed. This isn't because Safety Net Project is interested in seeing the proliferation of camps. It's because repeatedly moving and harassing homeless people out of sight does not resolve homelessness. Housing does that. Offer people housing versus living outside in a tent and see what happens. We suspect a lot more people will be housed and a lot fewer encampments will pop up. This is my last piece. 
Secondly, we support a supportive housing bill of rights. This is desperately needed and we thank you council member Levin for putting it forward. We have some specific suggestions uh, to language in our written testimony, but for the purpose of this moment, I'll simply point out that any resistance or pushback to ensuring tenants know their rights is evidence of just how much New York City does not hold reasonable expectations of supportive housing industry and how the city maintains a blind spot towards supportive housing tenants and applicants rights. With tens of thousands of supportive housing units in New York City, we can't allow supportive housing in aggregate to be a system that allows folks with disabilities to know or pursue their rights any less than those in market rate apartments. We, act, we can't act like the tens of thousands of supportive housing apartments are somehow also a space where poor people have fewer rights. The last point I'll make is just to Mike Boskett's uh, testimony uh, earlier regarding CAPS. Um, I will say that I'm not alone, but I can testify on my own behalf. S&P asked to become part of CAPS. HRA, uh, Mike Boskett in particular, Commissioner Boskett never found the time to respond. Other people were flat out rejected. As far as I know, it's the only COC committee that requires uh, an ability, uh, an assessment of whether or not someone should be put on. Uh, the supportive housing industries, Shani and other agencies were, are directly at the center of it, but advocates who are doing this work with people on the street are not. And that speaks to a lot of what we do or don't see at CAPS, including whether or not provider level rejections is actually available in that data. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. I'll now call on Giselle Ruthier, followed by Eric Lee. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Giselle Ruthier. I'm the policy director at Coalition for the Homeless. We have submitted written testimony in conjunction with the Legal Aid Society, which provides detailed information about issues our clients have encountered with supportive housing. I will summarize the main points now. As we reported at the last oversight hearing on supportive housing in 2018, our clients continue to encounter many issues relating to the application process, placement logistics, and services provided in supportive housing. On applications, the 2010 E eligibility determinations done by HRA allow for significant clinical and administrative latitude from HRA administrative staff who have no contact with applicants. And as a result, there is much inconsistency in the review process and eligibility outcomes. Some specific problems we have encountered include documenting unsheltered homelessness and a lack of a formal appeals process to dispute decisions. On the placement process, once an application, applica application is approved, a prospective tenant faces a new set of hurdles before receiving keys to an apartment. <clears throat> Applicants must undergo an interview with a supportive housing provider where experiences vary widely. For example, some applicants report having to complete complex forms during the interview or even to be considered for an interview, including paperwork that, once signed, waives their rights to manage their own money and benefits. On services, we have worked with many residents of supportive housing who are at great risk of leaving their placements because of a lack of appropriate services. In some supportive housing, case management is cursory and focused only on those requirements necessary for the provider's financial billing as opposed to the tenant's actual and expressed needs. Because of limited time, I will refer to our written testimony for full details outlining the problems our clients have encountered in the application and placement process, as well as within supportive housing. Uh, on the bills being heard today, we fully support intro 2176, which will create a bill of rights for supportive housing residents. This bill will provide a much needed uniform information resource for individuals moving into and currently living in supportive housing including information about tenants' rights, the regulatory and financing schemes for the unit, and relevant points of contact for any problems an individual living in supportive housing may encounter. We have a few technical comments on the language in the bill, which are detailed in our written testimony. The primary concern is that the bill proposes a new definition of the word tenant that does not match the definition in the real property law, and which could exclude current residents of supportive housing whose tenancy rights are not yet recognized from receiving critical information outlined in this bill. To be clear, we fully support the goal of making sure all supportive housing tenants have tenancy rights, but this bill is structured only to provide notice of people's existing rights, a critical and much needed resource, which we want every person living in supportive housing to receive. We also support intro 2177, which would prohibit police involvement in outreach to unsheltered homeless individuals. This bill is a long overdue shift away from addressing homelessness. Thank you for the council for the opportunity to testify today and for your steadfast commitment to addressing homelessness. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you, Giselle. I will now call on Eric Lee testify. 
Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eric Lee, and I'm the Director of Policy and Planning for Homeless Services United. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin and members of the General Warfare Committee for allowing me to testify today. Um, in the interest of time, I'll summarize my written testimony. Uh, while, we, while we recognize the scope of this hearing is largely focused on supportive housing oversight, we want to take the opportunity to discuss the immediate needs of unsheltered homeless New Yorkers, given the legislation being heard. Um, street homeless individuals are, are at mortal risk of both COVID-19 and freezing temperatures, and there must be a coordinated response led by DHS Street Solutions outreach teams, but supported by other city agencies and systems, including the Office of Emergency Management, the NYPD, the MTA, public and private hospitals, and faith providers. HSU strongly supports the decriminalization of homelessness and is in agreement with the council that clinicians and social workers must be the primary point of engagement with street homeless individuals. But we have concerns that intro 2177 would have detrimental impacts to both homeless clients and service providers. Prohibiting police officers from offering any connection to homeless services would effectively remove their ability and responsibility to assist homeless individuals. Officers will still engage street homeless individuals on their beat, but their only action that they would be limited to taking is telling them to either move along or arrest them if coordination with DHS is barred. Outreach efforts must, must be tailored to the individual situation to affect the best outcome for clients, and outreach teams need the ability to proactively involve the NYPD as necessary to keep staff and other homeless people, as, including the individuals engaged, safe. Current beneficial collaborations that would end under this, this bill would include police officers reaching out to DHS outreach teams when spotting homeless individuals and proactive NYPD involvement with outreach teams when moderating to act as a moderating presence to safeguard everyone in surrounding areas when engaging individuals with histories of dangerous or threatening behaviors, as well as during follow-up outreach canvassing in the same area to other individuals. With regards to homeless encampment sweeps, limiting or even banning sweeps that don't pose an immediate health risk would reduce opportunities for negative police interactions, better meeting the council's goal of stopping the criminalization of homeless people without compromising client, staff, or neighborhood safety. Cold weather has already claimed the life of a New Yorker this winter, and we are gravely concerned that lack of access to warm spaces will increase the number of people freezing to death. And we urge the city to create a multi-department response to stand up accessible daytime warming centers, as well as expanded nighttime options for individuals who choose not to enter shelter. This is a, there's a perfect storm of limiting factors, which are more further detailed in my written testimony um, with regards to uh, impacting and killing um, shelter adverse street homeless individuals. And we would welcome the opportunity to work with the council to create collaborative outreach efforts and develop additional spaces and resources to keep them safe. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much, Eric. I am now going to call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in this order. Laura Masu, Emily Friedman, and Sandra Gressel. And we'll begin with Laura Masu. Time starts now. Good morning, Chairperson Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee. My name is Laura Masu. I'm the Executive Director of the Supportive Housing Network of New York. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. We will be submitting written testimony, but wanted to highlight a few recommendations. Um, first of all, with the NYC 1515 program, we are pleased with the progress of development for congregate housing. However, the awards for scattered site program are falling below their goal. Over the past few decades, scattered site rates have become insufficient to cover both rent and services and many providers are hesitant to continue embracing the model, we would like to offer two alternatives. One is to reallocate the proportion of scattered site to congregate in NYC 1515, reducing the scattered site proportion to 25% and 75% for congregate development. Second, to look at reallocating scattered site service funding to help in the preservation effort we have a lot of existing preservation that has very minimal services in it, some as low as $2,400 a year. And these programs have buildings with sufficient and needed capital considerations. And so we would like to push some of the 1515 funding into that program in order to provide services that are needed that would go along with the capital. 
Shifting to existing housing, the existing scatter site program, as I just mentioned, is severely underfunded. And last year, money was added to the program, which was very helpful, but we'd like to see more money continue to be added. The current rate for a market rate apartment is $1,760 for an FMR. And this translates to over $21,000 per year for more scattered site projects. And the contract is only at 17 and that's only rent. In regard to HPD, we are pleased to see the partial restoration of 466 million in FY21, but remain concerned about the 583 million that was not restored in FY20. And we'd like to see a realistic plan for how these cuts will be restored. And also since the pandemic, HPD has not issued any soft commitment letters, which means that any new projects have been suspended for nine months. There has not been any acquisition or pre-development financing. And we'd like to see those soft commitment letters start up again. And lastly, the Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative is facing year five. There is no more funding in the program. This was the governor's commitment for 20,000 units over 15 years. And we need to see the governor commit to the next 14,000 units and hope the city council will support us in that effort. Thank you so much uh, for this, this moment to testify. Thank you so much, Laura. I'll now call on Emily Freeman, followed by Sandra Gressel. Over to Time you. starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Levin and committee members. My name is Emily Friedman, and I'm a staff attorney in the civil action practice at the Bronx Defenders. Thank you for your attention to these critical matters and for the opportunity to testify before you today. In the civil action practice, access to stable quality housing is an urgent need for many of our clients. We meet clients in two ways. First, through our interdisciplinary model, we work with clients who are facing housing consequences due to the criminal legal system or other court entanglement. The second way is through direct referrals from housing court as right to counsel providers in the Bronx. Through our housing work, we are familiar with the problems, deficiencies, and challenges tenants living in supportive housing experience, either because our clients are fighting to access supportive housing or because we are helping clients defend against displacement from their supportive housing. What is most troubling about these cases is that our clients have already fought through perhaps the hardest parts of their lives to be deemed eligible for supportive housing only to face losing it because of the very issues that made them eligible in the first place. They have significant histories of chronic homelessness, serious mental illness, and persistent substance use. With little income, often relying on social security benefits or public assistance, the supportive housing is one of their few opportunities to access transitional or permanent housing. When we meet our clients, it is because they're at risk of losing that critical opportunity. We support intro 2176, the Supportive Housing Tenants Bill of Rights as a necessary first step towards ensuring that those living in supportive housing are informed of the rights they already have. The Bill of Rights recognizes that those residing in supportive housing have an actual contractual right to live as tenants in the supportive housing site rather than merely stay there. This legislation will protect the most vulnerable New Yorkers because the bill requires written notice that centralizes and makes explicit tenant, tenants' rights, including grievance procedures and reasonable accommodations that will provide protections against discrimination, as well as providing alternatives to eviction and the bill's promotion of transparency, access to legal services, and meaningful notice of rights will prevent evictions. We urge the council to consider going even further. Specifically, the Supportive Housing Tenants Bill of Rights would be improved by increasing the level of enforcement and oversight, expanding due process protections, and tailoring the distribution of information to the needs of those that are struggling with recovery. We implore the city council to consider our suggestions and use this as an opportunity to enforce the rights of supportive housing tenants to the fullest. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak on such important matters. Thank you very much, Ms. Friedman. Thank you, Emily. I will now call on Sandra Gressel. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairperson Levin and committee members for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. My name is Sandra Gressel, and I'm a senior staff attorney in the Mental Health Law Project at Mobilization for Justice. 
To begin, I want to thank Chair Levin for his leadership on this issue and for putting forward intro 2176, which MFJ fully supports. The Mental Health Law Project at MFJ witnesses daily the power of supportive housing to positively transform and stabilize the lives of our clients. However, we also witness the many challenges New Yorkers face in accessing supportive housing, understanding and asserting their rights to meaningful support services and habitable housing, and maintaining their supportive housing. Supportive housing programs operate through a patchwork of different funding streams and are subject to different regulatory frameworks that can be confusing for an advocate, let alone a tenant, to untangle. The lack of clear, accurate information regarding applicable rights and options for recourse and enforcement of said rights dilutes the essential supports intrinsic to the supportive housing model and contributes to a very real sense of housing insecurity for those who are lucky enough to even get placed. Given the timeline, I was regretfully unable to coordinate with individual tenants to testify directly today, but I do want to share a couple stories to remind us all why this is so important. Earlier this year, a community organization referred Hannah to our intake line. After aging out of the foster care system, she moved into a supportive housing SRO unit subsidized by Project Based Section 8 while pregnant with her first child. Uh, after she disclosed her pregnancy to the supportive housing program, she was misinformed that she would need to move out of the building and leave the program immediately after giving birth because her unit is an SRO and is for single adults only, no children. This was a young woman, first time mother to be, with mental health disabilities, who had never lived independently in the community before. And as you can imagine, she was petrified. Earlier this year, Jackson also contacted our intake line. He has bipolar disorder and PTSD in part related to prior assaults by a past roommate. He had requested a reasonable accommodation transfer to a single occupancy unit because his mental health prohibited him from residing with roommates. Although he supplied ample medical documentation, the supportive housing program informed him that this is a business and they have no single occupancy units. Fortunately, someone referred him to MFJ several months later, and when the program wouldn't respond to our reasonable accommodation request, we filed a complaint at the New York City Human Rights Commission. However, the unavailability of a written notice of rights and what his recourse was and the availability of legal services um, meant that he was prevented I'm from inspired. asserting his rights sooner and his health and well-being suffered due to the delay. Hannah and Jackson's stories are not exceptions. I could share stories all afternoon. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that generally speaking, our nonprofit providers are doing the very best that they can with extremely limited resources. However, it is clear that a written bill of rights would go a long way towards equipping tenants with the tools they need to ensure they have the stable housing and support services they deserve. Um, in conclusion, uh, I also want to um, Reference back to what Chair Levin said earlier about the need for tenant advocates um, and disability advocates to be at the table. Um, MHLP welcomes the opportunity to partner with city council, the administration, city agencies, and the supportive housing industry to work together to ensure that people with disabilities have the housing they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. I'm now, I'm now going to call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order. Deborah Berkman, Sarah Blanco, James Dill, and Lyric Thompson. And we'll begin with Deborah Berkman. Time starts now. Thank you. Chair Levin, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the Committee on General Welfare on supportive housing and homeless outreach. My name is Deborah Berkman and I'm a coordinating attorney in the Public Benefits Unit and the Shelter Advocacy Initiative at the New York Legal Assistance Group or NILEG. NILEG is a civil legal services organization who combats economic, racial, and social injustice by advocating for people experiencing po poverty. We aim to disrupt systemic racism by serving individuals and families who legal and financial crises are often rooted in racial inequality. I'm the coordinating, coordinating attorney of the Shelter Advocacy Initiative at NILEG. The Shelter Advocacy Initiative provides legal services and advocacy to low-income people in and trying to access the shelter system and for those experiencing street homelessness. 
The proposed local laws, intro 2177 and intro 2176, would have a very positive impact on my clients' lives, and we wholeheartedly support them. Removing police officers from engaging in the outreach process to individuals experiencing homelessness is an important step towards making outreach to those individuals more effective. Police officers are not trained social services providers, and many, if not all, of my clients experiencing street homelessness are afraid of contact with the police. Those clients experiencing street homelessness generally don't just end up on the street, and most of them have actually stayed in shelters before, and they found it intolerable to be there. There are many reasons that this may be the case, but quite a few clients describe violent interactions with shelter police, staff, and other residents, and fear for their safeties. safety. Other clients have had traumatic interactions with the NYPD, and as a result, avoid police contact. Some of Nylex clients are, who are experiencing street homelessness also have mental illness and other mental health issues. Uh, and some of these clients describe the presence of police officers as increasing their anxiety and exacerbating their symptoms of their mental illnesses. Additionally, while homelessness itself is not a crime, there are laws that criminalize conduct inherent in living on the street, such as public urination or other so-called quality of life issues. Clients have described interactions with police officers purportedly engaging in outreach that have ended in a citation or even an arrest. And for someone experiencing street homelessness, even getting a ticket can be devastating. If they don't pay their ticket, most likely because they can't afford to do so and don't appear in court, they may be subject to a bench warrant. An arrest may also lead to job loss and difficulty obtaining a job, either because they're not able to attend work or because their interactions with the criminal law system. Contact with the criminal legal system can also result in a criminal record that may prevent people from qualifying for NYCHA housing. Thus, interactions with enforcement can act, in, law enforcement excuse me, can actually perpetuate homelessness. Another reason that clients are hesitant to engage with the police is that some clients experiencing street homelessness have had their belongings taken or destroyed by the police as part of sweeps or, or as they're sometimes referred to, cleanups. Time expired. Oh, okay. Uh, when an encampment is scheduled to be cleaned up, uh, clients have no choice but to carry away what possessions they can hold in their arms. Um, this has led to my clients losing many, losing many of their best possessions. And the bill specifically addresses this by defining outreach as including the uh, removal of individuals' personal property. To sum up, we greatly support both of these bills. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'll now call on Sarah Blanco. Time starts now. Hello, uh, good afternoon, Chair members of the General Welfare Committee and everyone in this room. My name is Sarah Blanco. I serve as the Clinical Director at Midtown Community Court, a project site of the Center for Court Innovation. First of all, thank you. With the council's support, Midtown Community Court was able to support the population touched by this hearing by purchasing and distributing food, PPE, clothing, and blankets in and around Midtown. Alongside our amazing community partners, we were also able to, to provide naloxone kits, flu shots, COVID testing, and linkage to medical care. Additionally, Midtown Community Court social workers continue to, to provide individual and group counseling, mental health support, and harm reduction services. Based on our experience in Midtown since the 1990s, homelessness, mental health, mental illness, and substance use are, effect, are not effectively addressed through a pre penalizing criminal justice approach they're more effectively addressed through a public health approach. Our written submission details two pilot programs we are launching to address the intersection of homelessness, mental health, substance use, and criminal justice system involvement based on our experience and what is effective. The first program is tentatively named the Community First Pilot Program. It is a collaboration with Times Square Alliance, Breaking Ground, and Fountain House. The coalition feels it is important to utilize alternatives to traditional policing to solve the community concerns that are emerging in and around Times Square during this pandemic. This pilot program will be a holistic community response, working to link individuals to social and wellness services. We do this by employing teams of community navigators, individuals with lived experience, who will really be boots on the ground to provide outreach to unsheltered individuals. Utilizing our partnerships, we'll engage them in substance use and mental health and medical services, but also connect them to essential, essential services such as housing, bathrooms, showers, and clothing. Additionally, Midtown Community Court, in partnership with Fountain House Again, the Midtown North Precinct, NYPD's Behavioral Health Unit, is launching Midtown's Rapid Engagement Initiative. 
For many individuals living with serious mental health issues, substance use, housing and food instability and insecurity, we recognize that these untreated needs can escalate quickly into crisis. These individuals may encounter police at the moment of crisis and need immediate support. This moment is critical and requires a coordinated approach for tools law enforcement does not have available at the time and are most needed when someone is brought to the precinct. This initiative would fill a gap that currently exists by staffing a social worker and a peer navigator on call to the Midtown North Precinct who would engage, who would engage individuals in voluntary services after the person is released from the precinct. It would be rapid engagement, immediate engagement. Addressing issues of homelessness, substance use, and mental health requires a public health approach. I'm expired. And we hope to continue to demonstrate its effectiveness. I want to thank the council for supporting the Innovative Justice Solutions Initiative that permits us the flexibility to provide community-based solutions to our most vulnerable community members. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Blanco. I'll now call on James Dill, followed by Lyric Thompson. Time James starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Dill, uh, Executive Director of Housing and Services, Inc. We shorten our name to HSI. HSI is a not-for-profit uh, developer and operator of permanent supportive housing. I wish to speak about the impact of the lack of uh, HPD soft commitment letters and, uh, F and the FY20 uh, capital budget cuts uh, are having on the uh, supportive housing industry in uh, New York City. We are participating in the city's very successful NYC 1515 program that streamlines the development of urgently needed supportive housing. And we're currently constructing an HPD funded project up in the Bronx. However, the lack of HPD's soft commitment letters and the shortage of HPD capital funds has shut down the city's supportive housing industry's ability to access NYC 1515 funds for new projects. HPD commitment letters are required to leverage acquisition, pre-development, and construction funding from other sources. HSI has struggled without success to find alternative sources of funding and is losing out opportunities to acquire sites at cheaper COVID rates. Shutting down the pipeline of supportive housing development will not save money in the long run, but will only result in uh, longer shelter stays and dramatically increase the costs of uh, other uh, services such as uh, emergency rooms, incarcerations, and other less humane Band-Aid solutions. Beyond the monetary costs, the pandemic highlights the ever-mounting costs paid by New York City's most vulnerable, primarily persons of color. Now more than ever, the city needs supportive housing to relieve overcrowded shelters and to prepare for a looming pandemic-created eviction crisis. The unintended consequence of the H lack of HPD commitment letters is that not-for-profit developers are losing good sites to for-profit developers with quick apps access to capital. HPD, uh, HSI has already lost two great sites to, uh, for, to the for-profits. After years of skyrocketing land prices, the pandemic offers opportunities for lower land acquisition costs. Without access to HPD capital, the, Supportive housing will cost the city even more as land prices escalate post-pandemic. HSI urges the committee to consider the ramifications of the lack of HPD commitment letters and the need to restore HPD's FY20 capital budget. With a housing tsunami losing, now is the right time to supercharge the city's supportive housing pipeline for both fiscal and humane purposes. I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak and uh, I'm very thankful for the 1515 program, the project we have, uh, the support we got from HPD, HRA, and uh, DOHMH. Uh, we would love to do more. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jim. Thanks again, Jim. I am now going to call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in this order, Arlo Chase, Theo Chino and Chi Ose. We'll begin with Arlo Chase. Time starts now. Uh, 
Sorry. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Um, yes. Hi. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was on another Zoom. Anyway, uh, apologies. Uh, my name is Arlo Chase. I'm senior vice president with services for the underserved. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, Chair Levin, miss seeing you at the Park Slope Food Co-op, but you know, maybe uh, sometime soon, hopefully. Um, so Still members, you just in, you know, uh, way, wayward member. Yes. Uh, uh, so, um, excuse me one second. Um, Um, so SUS, for those of you who don't know, is a social service and housing organization. We've been around for 41 years. We provide housing and services to a whole ra range of folks, um, people with developmental disabilities, mental illness, addiction challenges, as well as just low-income New Yorkers. We operate 150 programs and about 120 sites throughout the city and all five boroughs. Um, so I'm here to just testify on a couple of the points, uh, mostly were echoed very well by uh, Laura Shu. Um, first of all, the HPD capital budget cuts are, you know, I think extremely and thankfully, you know, half of them th this year, the fiscal year I know was reinstated, but um, the, it would be really wonderful and, and to the create continued production of supportive housing to reinstate the cuts from last year. Um, we have several projects uh, that are awaiting funding that are, we have land, we, we own the sites, we have uh, site control, we have zoning, we're just waiting for the money and we could create um, close to a thousand units of housing uh, for both supportive and low income with the, uh, with the HPD funding that we're waiting for. The other thing as uh, Laura testified to the, the HPD current policy of not issuing site support letters. We were one of the organizations in the market to buy vacant land to um, try and create even more opportunities for supportive housing. And the current policy um, has really stopped us. We're, we're out of the market basically. And, you know, at this time, you know, as everyone on this call probably knows, housing and housing development has always led the recovery from the city's um, depressions and economic downturns. And, and when land is cheaper, it's a, it's a great opportunity for organizations like SUS and the rest of the supportive housing community to, uh, to be able to capitalize on those opportunities. Um, and I think I'll end my testimony there. Appreciate any questions. Thank you very much, Arlo. Thank you, Arlo. I'll now call on Theo Chino, followed by Chi Ose. Time starts now. Hi, Councilman Levine. Um, my name is Theo Chino. Um, I'm just upset. I mean, I, I don't know what else can I say. I hear HPD and all that stuff, the homeless and this and that. Maybe it's time not to put more money, but actually to go over HPD housing stock and go over their spreadsheet and look at where the stock of HPD housing that they have empty is sitting, just right there, my building, third party transfer, 30 units that are empty for 20 years. You walk two store over, 100 units that are empty. You walk to 150th Street where I talked to the tenant, they forgot they were even HPD building, 70 unit empty, and they're waiting 20 years for them for their repair. Finally, someone call in and say, and they say, who owned this building? Well, neighborhood restore and all that stuff. And they lost them in the spreadsheet. And we're talking about money and billion of dollars left and right. What are we doing? I mean, I run a, right now I run a, a, a database called La Shit List, where I have put all the candidate on it. And I have put all of ACRIS on it. And I have put all of the FCC data to go match and rematch all the data of where HPD have lost unit so I can find candidate to run for office. I am a one person with a $300 computer and able to figure out. Right here in my coalition of people of La Shit List, I have a homeless man, $3,500 they're paying for his thing in a $20 not even a $20 
what would be a $20 Airbnb fined by HPD, we're paying $3,500 for that man to be in a shelter. And you're telling me that we cannot house our homeless? What kind of bullshit is this? Yeah, why are you muting me? I mean, you want to talk data or you want to talk? You have any question? Let's talk right now. Any data you want to know? I mean, what can I tell you? Block by block, how many units? Councilman, let's talk. I'm here. Well, I don't necessarily have any you know, questions prepared for to ask you, but um, I'm, well, I mean, I, you know, I welcome. What do you want? What can I send? We've been sending, we wanted an investigation. Yesterday, half of the organization came with a slumlord report called United Housing for All. Basically, this is like nonprofit giving up New York the way the colonizer divvy up Africa. Basically the same way. How can we make money out of, of everybody in New York? So you tell me and I'll help. I'm here to help, but I'm tired of sitting here, hearing after hearing, hearing the same thing and nothing is done. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Let me know, I'm available. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm now going to call on Chi Osei. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. Thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Also, it's funny that I'm following up because I'm also on the shit list. Um, good afternoon, Chair, Honorable Council Members and guests. My name is Chi Osei. I'm an activist, organizer, concerned citizen, and political candidate running for City Council in the 36th District. I'm one of the co-founders of the educational and activist collective Warriors in the Garden. And since the beginning of this summer, we have been organizing marches, protests, children's marches, and distributing educational content regarding race relations in our country. We were at the forefront for the push to repeal 50A, have organized black business expos, and are planning on expanding progress in our community. As an individual who has led many of the marches and protests this summer, I'm aware of the demands that many New Yorkers are asking for when it comes to the NYPD and their operations. When we talk about reimagining public safety, that includes removing police control from the well-being of our unsheltered New Yorkers. As an ear on the streets, we are asking for police to be removed from the crisis of homelessness and allow for more qualified agencies to do their jobs. The NYPD's job is to answer to criminal activity. Mental impairment and instability is not a crime, but in New York City, it is often responded to in that way. With that being the case, rather than mental health professionals arriving at the scene, armed officers do which can escalate situations and harm New Yorkers. The houseless need help around shelter, stable employment, and steady counsel. The NYPD is not the answer to these problems, which is why the mayor's offers stopped organized units focused on the unsheltered. Instead of funding the NYPD to intercede with our unsheltered New Yorkers, we must further reinvest in the Department of Homeless Services, Social Services, HRA, and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We can expand when needed programs like the 15 for 15 mandate and support for community advocates. This allows for interactions with the unsheltered to be led by professionals. Support for intro 2177 is vital and the authoring of it is commendable. In summary, this is about mental health services, employment and temporary and permanent shelter for New Yorkers. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Thank you again. At this point, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, we ask that you please use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you in the order your hand is raised if we inadvertently missed you. Seeing none, Chair Levin, we've concluded public testimony for this hearing. Chair yeah, Levin, you're on mute. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Council Kilowan. Um, so seeing no other testimony, um, I wanna thank everybody um, who testified today, uh, members of the administration, uh, members of the public who testified. I also wanna um, thank uh, all staff that worked on today's hearing, um, uh, our sergeants uh, for conducting the hearing, uh, Joanna Castro for 
um, for, for organizing this. And um, I look forward to, to working with all of you. There's, um, I have about a year left in this, in this role as chair of this committee. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can um, uh, and everything that, that, that's achievable um, to make this uh, entire program supportive housing uh, in New York City more effective at uh, bringing stability, housing stability, um, health stability um, to those New Yorkers that really rely on it and need it. Um, and there's still a lot more work to do um, and there will be a lot work left to do uh, after I leave office, but we wanna do everything that we can. Um, and with that at uh, 4.30 p.m., this hearing is adjourned.